Sebastian Sansón Real. Did two men with a trunk get off here by any chance? We? Oui? Which way did they go? That way, monsieur. Oh, where are we anyway? Guiza. France. Let me help you, monsieur. There is a taxi out front and a hotel nearby in Rennes le Chateau. Appreciate it. Alright, so we are playing Gabriel Knight 3, this is the commentary version. The video is sped up because the original gameplay is almost 16 hours. And I'm fairly certain that no one wants to hear me talk for 16 hours. I can barely stand hearing myself talk for a couple of minutes. But when you do a commentary video, unfortunately you just have to hear yourself talk. Now one of the things that I did with Gabriel Light 3, um, you'll see it kind of like what I did here with the wallet. Um, there's a lot of post editing when I when I uploaded the video. So for example, um, when this game came out was obviously quite some time ago, and like uh, the resolution uh, typically that the game was played at was 640 by 480. Uh, what I did is I wanted to play it at its highest definition, which was 1920 by 1080. However, that created a few problems, uh, namely, we'll get to it eventually, uh, when you use Sydney, the screen, the way that the computer is drawn, the, uh, Sydney is a computer, uh, the way it's drawn is misaligned. So you have like part of the monitor to the left, part of the monitor is up in the upper right hand corner, and all these different things that basically make using it at that resolution impossible. So I basically had one shortcut that would run it in 1920 by 1080 for Gabriel Knight 3. And then anytime I had to use Sydney, excuse me, I had to basically ex save, exit, run the second shortcut that would run it at 640 by 480, which would allow me to use the Sydney computer. So what then I had to do then was basically when I was put, uh, splicing this all together, 
I would have to basically resize the 640x480 into a 1920 uh, resolution, which thankfully it didn't distort too badly. Uh, it just kind of looks like it stretches some of the letters in Sydney, but it's not bad at all. But what I also did is a number of times when uh, I was looking at a inventory item, I would actually zoom in uh, post, you know, not in the in the game itself, but in the post edit, I would zoom in closely like I did with the wallet earlier to get a good look at it um, in terms of the game, because otherwise it was really, really small. And also, um, there's a number of cutscenes in the game that are also at like 320 by 200. So found all those files, basically extracted them and put them at a higher resolution, which was 1920 as well. And uh, there's a few scenes, especially where it's uh, the time passes, like at the very beginning, it starts off at, I believe it's at 10 a.m. to 12. And those were also like by 320 by 200. So I took that post edit and enlarged it as well. I think I got most of them. I think there's a few that slipped by uh, post edit that I forgot to resize. But overall, I spent a lot of time basically in 1920, save, exit, back into 640 by 480 every time I had to use Sydney, post edit, resizing the screen to get a larger view of stuff. So I, I really enjoyed playing Gabriel Knight 3. Um, I always forget how good this game is, um, except for the portion with Sydney. And the Sydney thing, it's not because I had to keep switching back and forth between the 1920, save, exit, go to 640, do whatever I need to do in Sydney, save, go back to 1920, load that game. But uh, it was mostly because the Sydney stuff, if you were not paying a lot of attention uh, to some of the clues that are being given as essentially Grace, who will come into the, into the game a little bit later, um, as she's doing stuff on Sydney, uh, some of that stuff was, I don't want to say it was difficult, uh, because if you are really, really, really paying attention, uh, you could get it. But a lot of times I felt like it was very, for me, like obviously Grace as the character knew what she was doing. But me as a player, I'm clearly not as smart as Grace <laughs> by any means. And so there were times where I was trying, uh, there was a part where you have to do a circle and you have to fill it in with a shape. And I was doing different shapes, trying it, different things. And uh, I eventually got it. But like I put it in a shape and it didn't do anything. So I took the shape, made it bigger, smaller, bigger, smaller, took, you know, resized it inside, slowly started spinning it. And in hindsight, if you look at it, it all makes sense uh, because you're looking at the various clues and you're like, oh, I see, it's supposed to be this. But a lot of that was post the clue being discovered. <laughs> uh, anyway, so we start the game where, as I said, we're at the beginning of day one, and it is no shock uh, that, as I said, Grace will be coming into the game a little bit later. But the gentleman right there reading the newspaper is none other than our good friend Gabe's, uh, Gabe's good friend, Mosley, who uh, we know from Gabriel Knight 1, he was a police officer. And uh, what's cool is Mosley has a secret that you will find out later on in the game. He says he's here basically to check out the treasure and stuff, and he's a part of the tour group, but there is more to Mosley's story for sure. And just like uh, all the other Gable Knight games, I think part of the reason why my gameplay was 16 hours is, just like the other ones, I didn't use a walkthrough, and that will be painfully obvious when I'm using the Sydney thing. Uh, so a lot of times, when something happens, uh, you know, like some part of the story triggers forward, I would literally go back to all the other scenes, uh, or all the other areas, sorry, and I would look to see if anything there has changed as well. So Gabriel Knight really determines, uh, just like the other ones in Gabriel Knight 2, basically any, uh, even Gabriel Knight 1, and a lot of Sierra games, where once you've done something, it'll trigger something else to happen somewhere else, and so you kind of need to go to all those areas and check it out. Now, one of the things that was interesting in Gabriel Knight 3, uh, if you watch the normal gameplay, you'll see it. The sped up version might be a little more difficult because it's moving really fast. But Game of Night 3 had what I call, I don't know what the correct term is, but I call it a free roaming camera. So you would have Gabe and you can literally push the camera around anywhere that was within that area before, you know, 
loads into another screen. But you can basically have Gabe stand right outside uh, Rennes Le Chateau and move the camera around so you can move it over to the fountain, you move it over to the bookstore, and then like if you right click on the bookstore and tell him to open the door, he'll move instantly from that door to that location. Now what was cool, I didn't think about it at first, but uh, later on I actually position the camera in certain areas and will click on something to know that Gabe is gonna pass through the camera at a certain angle and kind of give a cool very, very like movie-like feel because I was setting shots up eventually later. Um, in the beginning, I was just clicking everything and trying to remember what I could from Gabriel Knight 3. And uh, that's an example where I was just talking about the free movie cameras. You can see that he was standing over by the van, but by clicking on that window telling him to look, he suddenly moved instantly to that location versus walking all the way around, coming slowly over. He just instantly moved to this location. And what's kind of cool is if you look, that picture right there is none other than, than Jane Jensen, who is the writer and creator of the Gabriel Knight series. So I thought that was kind of cool that they uh, they put a picture of her in the game. That was a nice move. So here's all the mopeds. Right now it is closed because the tour has not started. So a lot of this in the beginning is just kind of like walking around and checking out different areas of where Gabe can go, what he can see, what he can interact with. And so this place is uh, private property. Sorry if you can hear my corgi barking in the background. Uh, so that area, the house, was private property, so you can't get to it, but eventually you will. Something will trigger, <laughs> and uh, you'll go there. And so over there you can see the entrance, and what you can do is push the camera around, and you can see, whoops, this is one of the, so this is one of the weird quirks with pushing the camera, where sometimes the angle can get kind of difficult to push the camera to where you need to go. And that happens later on when I'm trying to get to a cat. And if you've played Gabriel Knight 3, you know about the cat mustache. Um, I had difficulty, A, trying to remember where this cat was, because it is off the beaten path uh, within Ren Ren Le Chateau. And so, if you don't walk by this cat and see it, you really don't know to do anything about it. And like I said, how you get to this cat is not somewhere where you're commonly walking by. So it would have been better if the cat was near the fountain, near this chicken that you see walking around, like stalking the chicken or whatever, but it's not. So you can see here's the church. Now, before we walked up to the door, there was a path to the right. And what you have to do is basically camera push your path, or camera push the, uh, the camera all the way down that right path, turn left, camera push all the way down, and then click Gabriel to move, and then he'll go into a different area which is essentially this random dead end with a uh, with a few doors and a cat. And that's where he, the cat is at. But getting to that cat is, like I said, it was definitely a pain. And one of the things you want to do, definitely in it, any Sierra game really, but especially Gabriel Knight, because Jane Jensen does so much to add detail and story, is you want to look at everything, because it's all going to pretty much give you a clue. Uh, and the amount of detail that went into Gabriel Knight 3 is rather amazing because all of these photos, all of these statues, they all have a comment to them. And even some of them have a story saying, hey, that's a picture of so-and-so and so-and-so when this happened. This is a picture of so-and-so and so-and-so when this happened. I mean, it really, this game really puts you in that area. So... It's always good to look at everything and really get a feel for how much detail and story is in Gabriel Knight 3. So this is one of the things that I thought was, I couldn't figure out, and I know there's something to it because there is that red dot on the picture of the four angels. And there is something that comes up later, <coughs> excuse me, with Grace uh, in terms of that uh, angel, or the, sorry, the four angels, and something to do with their hand, but I could never figure it out. I've not looked at a walkthrough yet to see how it's done, 
but I am positive there's something to it because that red dot is there. And I'm sure you probably have to click in a certain pattern to make the dots work in a, in a certain way. But I did not figure that out. Also, this, that grave right there with the sign, um, I never found out what, what was more to it. I'm sure I missed it somewhere in the story, but that seems like a significant, uh, grave site. So here's that, uh, that random alleyway that you need to move down and it's even pushing the camera it's very difficult to get down that alleyway so seems like i couldn't even get to it as a matter of fact so if we go over here there's a museum that oh i was going to talk about that earlier one of the odd things is sometimes when you click to view in something and if you just pan away from it rather than click the magnifying glass to go out uh, the camera does get stuck in that view so there's a few times where like I was looking at the museum sign and the camera and I just pulled the camera away ra rather than click the magnifying glass to uh, zoom out. And uh, the camera does get stuck in that view. And naturally everyone you come across, um, I love this dialogue tree, the way it works is you just click on them and it has an icon. If you hover over the icon, it tells you what it's gonna ask about. You want to talk to everyone and ask them about everything that you can. Uh, I cannot emphasize like how much story uh, Jane Jensen put into this. And she did so much research that it feels very real. Like this could be a real thing. So it's, it's an incredible amount of work. And she does that with all of them. I mean, okay, there's a part where something to do with vampires and stuff like that um you know and they're not they're not the traditional vampires of uh uh you know fly and turn into bats and in daylight they burn but you know obviously that part seems a little far-fetched now the one thing there is that hat that was in the uh the bin and when gabe tries to look at it he says, oh, you know, it's it's not my hat or whatever. That's misleading because eventually, after a series of other events, Gabe will come back. And that hat will actually be available to pick up. So that's, uh, you know, that's like, not misleading. That's just kind of tough because you would think, oh, I clicked on the hat. I don't need it. I can't pick it up. When actuality, you will actually need it later. It's just a few other things need to happen first. So uh, that's uh, that was a tough one, and I probably only remembered because I recall that Gabe essentially needs to disguise himself. Um, but for someone else who might be playing Gabriel Knight Three for the first time, they just might think, "Oh, you know, I can't get that hat, so no need to come back for it. So I don't know how to complete this disguise." It might have been better that the hat become, you know, if you look in there prior to that disguise being available, that it's empty. And then when the disguise option becomes available, if you come back here, now there's a hat. So that way it doesn't kind of throw off players that they don't need it. And like I said, I went through everything and I was clicking everything to get the maximum amount of story out of the game and the problem is when if you play gabriel knight like non-stop like from start to finish uh try to do it probably within like a day or two uh it's probably way easier to retain everything um but my playthrough of gabriel knight was probably over the course of two weeks so there were times where i would read something or i'd see something like i might see this sign here with the circle and the the uh triangle in it and later on, that is significant, but however, it was like six days ago that I played it, and I don't remember the significance of that symbol and stuff like that. 
So that is one thing that is difficult about Gabriel Knight 3, is it does have so much story and so much information that if you are playing it over the course of many, many days, um, it is easy to forget some of the things that you've read or some of the things that you've seen that later on become significant, especially when you're using the computer Sydney. The, the characters, such as these two, uh, in Gabriel Knight 3, I mean, these are some of the... It's hard to say, because in Gabriel Knight 1, there was a bunch of great characters. I mean, uh, Mosley and Grace aside, because there are such main characters, um, Gabriel Knight 1 had a lot of good characters. Um, but overall, um, character-wise, Gabriel Knight 1 is the weakest. Gabriel Knight 2 introduced a bunch of great characters. Oh, so there's one that I missed to increase the size. Uh, Gabriel Knight 2 introduces a bunch of great characters. Uh, they're really well done. The actors are amazing. But I think the characters in Gabriel Knight 3 are actually very, very uh, fun. Uh, they're all very different. They're all very quirky. They all definitely stand out as their own. And uh, <laughs> including this guy, Jean. Jean? Uh, they're all so well done. And it's clear that Jean here um, may enjoy the company of men in terms of how he reacts to Gabriel versus how he reacts to Grace. He seems more rude to Grace than every time Gabriel says something. He's always like, oh, you're so nice. <laughs> and this is Wilkes, and I already forgot her name, but she's the tour guide, the redhead, whom Gabe naturally flirts with. Wilkes is the, uh, <laughs> he's a little bit of a drunkard and, uh, kind of, uh, chauvinistic, if you will, uh, <laughs> especially later on with Grace. Um, but, uh, it's, uh I, I won't say it now, but good old Wilkes, something happens. And here you can see as you come upstairs that these two have switched rooms. And you'll find out why. Um, <laughs> I love that. <laughs> the uh, older woman makes the uh, blonde do everything. Uh, but you'll find out that uh, why he needs that room. And then when you go downstairs and look at the, uh, the book, it'll note that the rooms have been swapped in there as well. So now that we see that something's happened where they've changed rooms, now it's... Once again, you can go around, kind of look at everything, see if anything has changed or become available. Because as I said, we did we did see the time also change from 12 to 2. So as you can see in the church, there is now more people, uh, more conversations to over here. And at Gabriel Knight 3, I do know that certain things will trigger so like, for example, hearing these two may open up something else, but if you go into a different order, you could potentially miss other stuff. Uh, so I know for certain, uh, also because of my score at the end, there's a lot of what I missed. Even though I finished the game, I think I was somewhere like 40 points off. So there are definitely things that I missed in this game. One of them is probably that four angel thing that's right there. Um, so there's clearly more I could have done and probably more I could have seen that because I didn't go in a specific order, I missed it. In that regard, it's kind of like the uh, Lore Bow um, Colonel's Bequest, where depending on where you move, you could see certain events. Um, unlike Colonel's Bequest, I didn't save and then try different areas. Each time it moved forward, I just let the game go through because I knew this was a much longer game than Colonel's Bequest and no one wants to watch like over 24 hours of Gabriel Knight 3. And so when you talk to him, you can get a lot of information about the church from him, but he, you will discover, also has a secret. We'll get to that later. So you can ask him about the church, the Templars, the treasure, all that stuff, and he'll give his opinion about it all. And you'll notice that there's only one set of pamphlets here, 
when Gabe looks at it, it's in French, and Gabe's like, uh, I don't know French. And so later on, uh, you'll find out, see, here's where you find out it's only in French. He says, I'll be, you know, I ran out of the American one, pretty much because of the tour group. I'll go ahead and reprint it and get some more out here. They become available, if I remember correctly, when Grace uh, comes around. And you can see, because I found more information from the pastor or the priest, I can now go to other people and ask them about some of the information that I've just learned as Gabriel. So anytime you kind of learn something, kind of go back around to the other people and see if they have anything to add to the conversation that you've just now discovered. And then you can go over here and visit Mosley, and you can try to get more information from Mosley as to why he's really here. And so he'll pretty much say, you know, hey, I'm just here, part of the tour group. And you ask him different questions about the treasure that he, that supposedly exists, that they're all out there to look for, pretty much. I can't recall who does Mosley's voice. Uh, in <laughs> talk about that in a second. Uh, in this, but he does a good job of sounding sort of like the uh, Mosley from Gabriel Knight One, who was portrayed by Mark Hamill, who's probably most known for Star Wars and being the voice of the Joker. Uh, so I don't know who they got for Gabriel Knight Three, but I'm pretty sure it was not Mark Hamill because he does indeed sound different. But. Uh, Tim Curry did return. He had originally done the voice in Gabriel Knight 1, as Gabriel only returned for Gabriel Knight 3. And I think that's pretty cool. Um, he must have really enjoyed doing the Gabriel Knight series because, I mean, it's, it's Tim Curry. Like, the dude is famous for everything. He's got so much on his book, and he is one of the actors of one of my favorite movies which is none other than the movie Clue. Uh, I watch Clue probably on a monthly basis uh, quite a few times. Uh, I love Clue. Um, but, you know, he's done so much more. Obviously, you know, he's Monty Python stuff, the, uh, all of that stuff. He's got a long history of movies and everything that he's done. So it was cool. Um, you know, I don't know if Sierra paid him a bunch of money to come back and do it. Or if, you know, obviously they paid him, but or if he was just willing to come back at whatever the normal pay is to voice the lines of Gabriel Knight because he actually enjoyed doing it. Uh, it getting him back to do this when we couldn't have uh, Eric... Uh, oh my gosh, I'm totally forgetting his last name. I want to say Dean Erickson, sorry. Dean Erickson. Uh, if we couldn't have him you know, as a FMV, or even it would have been fine if we couldn't get Tim Curry to get Dean Erickson to voice Gabriel Knight in this one, because then at least that, that would have still been the progression of uh, at least the same voice actor versus getting a third and different uh, voice actor for Gabe. So the fact that they did manage to get Tim Curry uh, is freaking amazing. And it either speaks to how much they paid him or how much he enjoyed doing this originally. These two, uh, <laughs> uh, probably from the uh, people that Gabe encounters, these two may be some of my favorites just because of their interaction between each other. 
and the woman in the uh, purple hat is hilarious in terms of how she talks about people. <laughs> you can tell she definitely comes from money uh, and is a little bit snooty. All right, so there's another one where I forgot to zoom in on the size, but we're continuing. But as we can see, people are leaving on mopeds. But before we get to that real quick, it's amazing how I played this a number of times and I just noticed something while I was re-watching the intro. Uh, when Gabe comes out, he's coming out of car number three. Now, the number three is often considered biblically to be of high significance uh, with like the Holy Trinity and stuff like that. So I wonder if him coming out of car three was intentional or if it was just a random number that they put on the car. But knowing Jane Jensen, I would say it was intentional. All right, so now, coming back, the time has shifted, and now people are actually starting to use mopeds. And when you talk to the guy, he pretty much tells you, hey, you know what? All the mopeds are rented out. The only one I have is this, like, really, like, purple, god-awful one that uh, Gabe would not be caught dead seeing. But when he looks at the thing, he does notice that someone has rented a moped, someone that he knows. That's none other than Mosley. So, and now comes the part where essentially we're going to have to make a disguise to trick the guy, since he knows what Gabriel Knight looks like. We're going to have to trick him uh, into thinking that we are someone else uh, named Mosley. So, this is where the infamous cat mustache begins to come in from. But, um, per typical, since something has changed and now the tour has started, going to all the different areas, uh, revisiting everything, seeing if anyone has anything new to say or any, or if there's anything new to see. Uh, because oftentimes other characters will uh, go and talk and you can overhear them. So in the previous talk, you remember how I said you can't take the red hat until the disguise thing comes in? So now suddenly Gabe is able to take that hat. Which again, it was there previously, but when you tried to take it, it would say, no, you can't. So that would be difficult for someone playing the game for the first time. And I do remember, not all the details, but I certainly remember eons ago when I first played Gabriel Knight 3 when it came out, how difficult that cat mustache disguise thing was. these two are amazing probably uh, i said it in my other one but probably two of my uh, favorite characters in terms of how they interact with one another <laughs> but again just kind of going through everywhere seeing if anything has changed since the moped thing has started and we've seen people leave on mopeds now one thing to note is uh and you'll see it when i'm driving around uh you'll want to start copying down people's uh license plates when you find out who is renting what moped uh in the end it doesn't really matter too much uh but certainly uh cool to know whose moped is whose now this is a part of where you're trying to do the Mosley disguise, and in order to do it, you need the peppermint candy thing. And then you need to buzz his door, but you need to do it when Jean is away. And then Mosley will come out from his room, and uh, you'll be able to pickpocket his uh, passport. Now, you will see, I think it was probably roughly around maybe five to ten tries before I was able to successfully pick Mosley's uh, passport. And you have to do it from a corner where he can't see you uh, when he tries to get the candy. If you do it wrong, he just eats the candy, which lets you know the candy's the key, but now you have to keep doing it until you get it right. This was, this is such a nightmare to pull off. And 
And the thing is, if you do it wrong, uh, he eats the peppermint candy anyway. So you've basically got to go back, get another peppermint candy, try again, and uh, see if you can do it. And even after I got it, I'm not even 100% sure <laughs> how I managed to do it correctly. Uh, it was just like trial and error over and over and over again of going up different set of stairs, you know, trying to come around the hallway in a different direction. <laughs> And like, uh, I couldn't remember if you have to do it before he leaves his room, after he leaves his room. Like, at what point is he eating this candy? <laughs> but again, if if you'd never played this game before to know that you have to steal Mosley's passport like this, this whole disguises Mosley thing is a very difficult... <laughs> Whoops, he already walked by. Uh, a very difficult thing to try to pull off in this game. Uh, even not just so much like trying to get the cat hair and the uh, tricking of Mosley to get his passport, but overall just thinking that you need to do this and how you need to do it. Uh, there isn't a lot of clue here unless you buzz his room and you see that he eats the candy and you can pick up the candy so you know maybe there's something to it. But definitely one of the more, <laughs> other than Sydney, other one of the more difficult puzzles in the uh, game. And so you can see it's before he goes down. However, I've stepped too far, so he sees me. And if he sees you, he pretty much finishes the uh, peppermint candy just like he just did, rather than dropping it. And then that allows you to pickpocket him. So, I mean, I do not know how... Mosley is not diabetic from the amount of times I've <laughs> tried to get this thing and he's eaten the peppermint candy. So in hindsight, uh, you pretty much set the peppermint candy first before you buzz his room. <laughs> but I guess one of the other things you do is while he's away, uh, you can actually go into his room, which I thought was part of the puzzle, and uh, you can take his jacket because you're actually going to need that as part of the disguise as well. So even though it's messing up, I still figured out part of it. <laughs> and there you go. You hit the sneak and he drops it and then you can pickpocket him so now we've got the hat we've got the jacket and we've got his passport we're almost good but what we need is every good disguise requires a mustache and apparently this mustache is going to be made out of cat hair So this is me looking around as to where this cat might be, because honestly I cannot remember where the cat was, like if it was like in a barrel or if it was in a crate. I just remember that the tape is required, and that's all I can really remember about this cat. So now I'm just wandering around everywhere looking for this cat. So here's this long, random alley. Which is very difficult to push the camera through. So it even seems like I can't go down to that alleyway. But over here, inside, we can get a water bottle, which we'll need for the cat. So it actually kind of works out that I accidentally went in there first. So uh, again, we're going to try this alleyway and it doesn't seem like I can push the camera over there. 
but the road is certainly open. So it looks like you can, but can't go over there. So that throws me off, and I just continue walking around looking for a cat. Unsure of where I might find said cat. <laughs> about the only place I haven't gone is this alley, which suddenly I'm able to camera push through, and voila, there's the damn cat. So first we're going to try to just pet the cat. Because I was trying to remember, do you put like the, the tape on your hand and then you pet the cat and that's how you get it, but no. Try to pet the cat and it goes into the door. Which seems like, okay, well, that's not it. Now we have a spray bottle. Let's try that. Let's go back into this alley that's really difficult to get to. And now we see that the cat has relocated itself up on the wall. So what you're going to do is you're going to actually put the tape on the door, which you technically would not know to do until you spray the cat, other than knowing that that's where the cat's going to run when you pet him. So go over there, spray the cat. It gets mad, goes through there. And what you're going to do is get the tape. And sure enough, you now have a cat hair mustache. Cat stash? Alright, now we're gonna make our way back out. So we've got his passport as well, I should say. Now you have to combine the items to basically make the Mosley disguise and put them all together so that you can click on it and pretty much say I'm gonna be Mosley Now the thing is, which I think is very weird, is you cannot change into the Mosley disguise until you're right at the motorcycle area, which of all the places you think he would see you. And so you flash the thing and he says, yep. And he says, well, which bike do you want? And you take the green Harley. Then you change out of your clothes back to the Gabe stuff and pretty much say, well, I better return all of uh, Mosley's stuff before he realizes it's gone. And now in this map, uh, you'll see a few things, but as you play the game, further areas will unlock and you can see where Gabe is at by the flashing green dot on La Renchetto. And then you just drive around and there is a lot of exploring here. And when people drive by, what you can do is you can actually click on them and follow them, and that will unlock more areas. And what you can do is once you follow them, you kind of figure out whose moped it is, and you can just start writing down mopeds. And then, look, someone else just drove by. So now you can follow them. And if they don't really go anywhere, it'll tell you. So you take your notebook, click on the license plate, and it'll say whose license plate it is. And you'll put all this information in Sydney. Now there is, I think it's a bug, because I got Mosley's license plate when he uses the purple moped. And I was never able to put it into Sydney. And I don't know if that's because I got it before I was supposed to, or what the deal is. But uh, because Mosley is not a quote unquote suspect in Sydney until later because clearly Mosley's up to something. But uh, anyway, this is Wilkes. He's got a thumper matter thing uh, that thumps on the ground. And Gabe makes fun of him about using this thumper because it reminds him of uh, the one movie where the uh, worms come out from the ground like tremors. So Gabe makes a few remarks. And then when you try to tell Gabe to go in the cave, he says, no thanks, last time I went into a cave, I got hairy palms. And uh, he's actually referring to Gabriel Knight 2, uh, in which 
he sees the hunter inside the cave devouring flesh and then thinks he is the uh, werewolf. So now we have Wilkes's moped and kind of know what Wilkes is doing. The voice actor for Wilkes is great also, by the way. And so this is the tour guide. Uh, no need to get her plate because everyone knows it's hers. You can read all the signs and see where they're at. And it's cool because they have the French at the top and then the English at the bottom. So you can see she's got some equipment. You can talk to her. Get some information, do some flirting. Which is funny because uh, while graphically, if, the, uh, if these characters were to appear this way, she is obviously a very attractive redhead. But the the night shift person at the at Laurent, the uh, hotel, more attractive uh, visually, and so is the person who works at the train station. To me, they are more attractive females than the uh, tour guide, but no, that's neither here nor there. Uh, if you try to get up there as Gabe, you won't be able to. Uh, Grace, however, will be able to make it up there. And there are some areas that are connected. So up here, we can get up here, look around. Um, this will be important after we get a set of binoculars, which we have. And we can actually look around and zoom in. So what I did is I started off with that orange thing in the ground and just kind of circled around. And then you can zoom in in certain areas where it'll tell you. So basically, I just would click it, do a full 360 of the view, bring the uh, binoculars down a little, do a full 360 of the view and see where I was able to zoom in and see people doing stuff. And so you can see he has a pair of binoculars and he's looking from the uh, place at the top, which is curious. Uh, you got to wonder if he's looking at Gabe, looking at him. So anyway, there's this area here, but also uh, if you side trail down from here, there's another area you can actually access that is also accessible through the motorcycle through a different path. And that would be this way. So you see this house with this guy. There's like a hole in his window. Man, that hole in the window threw me off because I totally thought he used the, the cup to hear it. But then what good would that do you? I mean, you're literally there with your whole head <laughs> sticking next to it. Uh, it is interesting that later on, Grace will also pick up a, a glass to be able to listen to people's doors. Um... And that might be where I missed something, but I went around to the doors a few times and I'd listen and you could hear stuff like people snoring or people taking a shower, but there was no conversation that could be overheard that was relevant. And so you talk to this guy anyway, so he's up here kind of away from everyone in, you know, in his house locked away. And he happens to know a lot about the Templars, the treasure. And so you kind of get a feeling definitely with his books that are around and his maps, there's also more to this guy. So this game definitely has things where people are far more than what they appear to be initially. He has a string of conversation you can talk to him about. So he'll pretty much just say, hey, you know what? I know a little bit, just out here studying, not really more to it, just like my privacy kind of thing. And uh, he seems to know a lot.
So we're going to head back to where our motorcycle is parked. We're going to go up the other side of the path. And... I think the, there is something that happens here, but other than that, there is not much to do at that location until there's something there to find. So another one where I forgot to zoom in on the, uh, the date time, but now date time has moved forward. So new things are uh, available to find and see. So we're gonna go to the train station first, try to confirm and see. I think she's more attractive than the, uh, the tour guide. Uh, but anyway, we're gonna try to find out who took what train uh, because you can talk to the people and find out what time they took their train. And you'll discover through her that there is no train that came through a specific time that one of those people told you where they said, oh, I came in at like eight o'clock at night. Uh, I don't have a car, you know, whatever. And you learn by looking, by talking to her and looking at the schedule, no such train came in at that time. And there's this guy here who's good to talk to because he'll have information. He was working when guys, the guys who supposedly thumped Gabe, uh, left with the crate that they had. And he has information pertaining to that, including the car, which way it went, uh, but you do have to pay him. Which really is not a big deal because Gabe actually doesn't use money for anything. It never shows like how much he has. So paying him is not that big of a deal in the game. Now we just go to a different place, find a different moped. And we can find out whose moped that is by heading up here, and it's Mosley. Which we could have figured out because originally the guy was. <laughs> I forgot. Mosley talks about how there was a mix up with his moped, and he the guy accidentally rented his moped to someone else. <laughs> Uh, but anyway, so you come over here and you can talk to Mosley. So now you know that's his moped that's down there, and you'll be able to grab the information on the moped. But once again, I am not sure because I grabbed it before uh, Mosley was put in Sydney as a quote unquote potential suspect that I was actually never able to attach Mosley's uh, license plate for his moped into Sydney. And I cannot wait to comment about the Sydney computer because not a fan. <laughs> so go to your notebook, grab it, and you write down it's Mosley's. And one thing I did love about this game is that. It wasn't like Police Quest where you had to actually physically drive the vehicle. You just had a map and you click on it and he drives to it. Uh, I think that was one of the weakest things about Police Quest was having to do the actual driving. I get that. They probably thought it was fun. Arcade sequence, whatever, was not fun. So I appreciate that in Gabriel Light 3, the map is just clickable. And I know Wrath, if you are... Or yeah, Wrath, if you're watching this, uh, you would probably also just tell me, well, you can do the same thing in Quest for Glory 2, where you can just buy the map once you make your way there, then you can just teleport where you want to go. But it's walking through the city before you get the map in Quest for Glory 2 that I cannot stand. 
there's a whole thread on the uh, Sierra help forums <laughs> between he and I. And since I haven't talked about it yet, if you haven't already, you should head to uh, sierrahelp.com and head to that site. There is a forum there also, which is at forums.sierrahelp.com, recently changed. Uh, highly recommend going there, checking out. Great community, very helpful. So if you have issues running into any games that are Sierra related, uh, there is a community there to help you. Uh, Collector has made several installers that can be used to run these games. Uh, he's also made some CD list installers. So if you have the game, for example, if you don't buy it on GOG or Steam or whatever, and you have Gabriel Knight 3, he has an installer that will install Gabriel Knight 3, and you don't even need any of the CDs after you install with the CDs. So it creates a CD list play. So definitely worth checking out the site. Again, that is sierrahelp.com. And now I'm back to Gabriel Knight 3. Uh, from this vantage point, we are able to, to talk to him as well as using the binoculars. And we see Mosley and the tour guide kind of in the same area bumping into each other. And we also write down more mopeds. And again, we can follow them. And here's Wilkes with his thumper. Now he's in a new location talking about how he's kind of figured out he's going to be the one by using echo technology or whatever it's called that basically it sends it pounds the ground sends images up to the satellite satellite basically casts down and sees anything that's underground so i'm assuming that's how it works So right now doing a lot of wandering around, trying to figure out what to do next. And not so much what to do is to, uh, because you know, right now it's very much in the information gathering area, but now it is six to 10 PM, another one where I forgot to zoom in. So day one is about to end. And now you can go basically get the other mopeds if they're not in. And you get here and Grace is here. And she's here with these two guards for the guy who hired you. Uh, so if you've not watched the intro, uh, Gabe is essentially uh, taking care or looking after trying to find an abducted child. And these two guys show up saying, hey, you know what, we're going to take this over. You know, it's highly sensitive. Uh, you're not doing what you need to do. We're just going to do it. And uh, Spoiler alert, it does not go well for those two. <laughs> and so now Grace is here and Grace is going to help. And in the background, uh, whenever you see the table here in a moment, you'll notice, th there it is, you can see Sydney, the most dreaded portion of the game. Uh, in terms of entering data, it's not that hard. Um, but <laughs> for Grace's part, when she's trying to figure out the riddle, it is that hard. So now things are definitely happening since uh, we're now at the 6 to 10 p.m. <laughs> uh, something happened in that room later uh, that I try uh, with the maid. And here's, uh, I think her name is Simone, who once again I think is more attractive than the actual tour guide. But there we have it. So that's Simone, you can ask her a few questions. She'll also be there to talk to uh, later when one of the guests seems to have disappeared. So. And again, so you can see in the, uh, the check-in book where that guy and the two women have swapped rooms. And then here's Wilkes chugging it up. <laughs> Uh, talking about his echo thingy and about the treasure and so he invites the guy over because he doesn't like to eat alone and they basically hang out <laughs> his machismo uh, cracks me up All 
right, so now we see those three guys who left Gabe's room, uh, and now you can tail them. And so they're headed into the graveyard, but also the priest lives in the uh, graveyard. So what you do is you click on that tomb, click on the sneak icon, and you're going to overhear these two talking to the guy. And there's the whole thing about the Templars and the everything that starts unfolding about was he responsible for kidnapping the guy's child and you know and he's like no that's something we would never do and he's saying we so now we know he's a part of an organization so and see how Gabe at least moves around the tomb when they leave Grace will eventually sneak over there and do something later uh, she doesn't even bother moving she just stays there uh, so I thought that was weird how at least Gabe was smart enough to move and Grace just stays there quiet as a cat and uh, she's not spotted. So these guys get in the car, drive off. So you can see. And you can follow. And remember I said that path goes into two different locations. So once you push the camera through, you're not going to go up to the top of the vantage point, but if you look in here, you'll see he's not there, but there at the car. So now to figure out what we have to do to make something happen, because they're just going to, they're not just going to stay in the car. This is the part that threw me off of, do I need to sneak somewhere? Where do I need to sneak? Like, what are these guys doing? And like Gabe's standing right out in the open. But what you have to do is kind of sneak over here by the tree. And you'll see them walk up. Now, this handshake, I sped it up so it's hard to see. Um, but they do it twice, and there's a reason for it. You need to know the handshake. So, when that handshake happens, make sure you make note of it. And hopefully uh, you didn't not make note of it. <laughs> And uh, miss it because you definitely need that handshake. So now we're, we know they're inside, and I'm just trying to see if there's any any way I can overhear what they're saying, what they're doing. But they don't go to that room with the uh, hole in it, so I just leave. I'm gonna go back to my bike. Go back to Renishatul. And as you can see, there are some mopeds missing here. So we know that is uh, Estelle, I believe her name is. And I forgot the other woman's name. Uh, but the two women, that's where, uh, that's their moped. So we've seen them drive by, so we can determine that that's theirs. So now let's go see if that priest guy has anything to say. Does not appear he does. There is this, and so you can kind of budge that window open, but it looks like it's stuck, so you'll need something to open it further. Uh, we'll get that a little bit later, because we don't have that yet. We're going to need the maid to be around for us to get the next thing that we need to get that window open. Again, just doing a lot of walking around, seeing if anything has changed now that we've seen a few things. The guys have left in the car. We followed them to that guy's house. We saw them do the secret handshake. And as you can see, things do happen. So now we see the two guide and the two, my two favorite women and <laughs> characters uh, talking with the tour guide about the treasure and whatnot. Now 
Gabe doing his thing with his pheromones. <laughs> if you've played the game, you'll see that he talks to Mosley that uh, the reason he gets to women is he just gives off pheromones. So now we see him. He's walking up. He goes into his room. And when we go inside, we see Mosley and Grace. Oh, Mosley. And so he's just talking about how he's catching up with Grace. We can ask him about the treasure, because uh, we've learned a few things, so Mosley will have more to say. And he says, you know, I saw these guys do this handshake. So you have to mimic the handshake with them. And so uh, Mosley and Gabe are going to go out, do some looking around, maybe a drink or two, and Grace will take over from there. All right, so we're on the next day now. Uh, we're on day two. And for the most part, we will be playing Grace, which means Sydney is about to come into play. And as she looks around, she can see Gabe sleeping, and she doesn't want to wake him up because Grace is nice like that. When I first looked in the closet, and saw that thing. I honestly thought it was like sheets of paper and I thought I would need it, but Grace is already carrying her notebook. Now the things on the table are for fingerprint kits, so there's one more, so uh, Gabe will use it. So here's the part where I was talking about every time I had to use Sydney, I would have to basically save beforehand and then launch the 640 by 480 and in order to make this as seamless as possible, where I could, where if it was just a needless save, like if I'm going from 1920 uh, to 640, and if you have no idea what I'm talking about, you can watch my previous comments, or I'll just explain it again. You know, I'll just explain it again. I played Gabriel Knight 3 in 1920 uh, by 1080p resolution. However, when you use Sydney, um, the computer, the way it works, this whole screen, does not work because it draws the computer in a very odd way. So like part of the screen's over here, part of the screen's over here, and it actually won't work. So you have to actually reduce it to 640 by 480. So I had two, um, two executables essentially to launch the game. So I normally played it in 1920, that whenever I had to use Sydney, I had to switch over. And what I was saying is to make it as effortless as possible is right before I would use Sydney, I would save, and then I'd launch the 640 by 480, restore, and start using Sydney, but so it wasn't as disruptive because of how often I had to use Sydney, uh, which is the computer. I cut out those areas where you see me save and restore because it, otherwise it'd be quite frequent every time I was having, switching back and forth between Sydney and then just playing Gabriel Knight. So in Sydney, it is essentially a database. Um, one of the things that Gabe talks about previously is, hey, you know, there's all this talk of blood and vampires and stuff like that. So you basically go down a rabbit, like I went down a rabbit hole. I don't even know if I had to click all these links, um, but I was trying to note which ones I hadn't clicked on. So I could go back and click it and then read all of this stuff. Because as I said in the other talk through, there is so much information in this game. And what I said in the other one uh, is if you play Gabriel Knight 3 pretty much um, back to back, like within just maybe a day or two, it's really easy to retain all this information you're learning. For me, I'm a much older man these days and my memory's not as good as it used to be. Um, I played uh, Gabriel Knight 3 over the span of like two weeks. So a lot of what um, I was learning through the game to try to remember, I would forget. So there would be portions. This part of, of Sydney is easy. This is just literally, it's Wikipedia. Uh, there's just links everywhere with a ton of information. Uh, but eventually you'll do more complicated things with Sydney. 
So right now I'm just doing some reading, seeing if there's anything here that is a clue as to what is going on in the game. And normally when I am not talking during the commentary, I'll speed up the game again. But what I've done this time is I've put the music of Gabriel Knight 3, I picked a few tracks that I really liked, and they play in the background, which you can hear as I'm talking. So when I am not talking about something like, obviously I'm not going to talk about the whole time while I'm reading all this stuff, because I actually spent a long, you know, I might actually talk the whole time, but I spent a lot of time going down several rabbit holes and clicking different links and reading all this information that was in here, not only to see if it gave me points or gave me a clue or stuff like that, but because I did so much work, I tried to get the most out of the game. Um, but anyway... Anticipating that I'm not going to talk the whole way through this, or there's going to be segments where I'm not talking, rather than speeding up the game, I'm just going to let the soundtrack play in the background. And if you were not aware, um, on my channel, I also uploaded not just the Gabriel Knight 3 soundtrack, but a bunch of different Sierra soundtracks. So if you're ever interested in listening to Sierra music in general, the soundtracks are on my channel. I even made a few for Halloween. Um, a lot of them include Gabriel Knight songs because he got that. Some of them have that weird, scary, creepy vibe that would make great uh, make a great Halloween track. Real quick, as I've said, there is a ton of information to find in Sydney, and I just want to commend Jane Jensen and whoever, if anyone else, helped her do this amazing amount of research, and then to type it all into the game. Uh, Gable Knight 3, uh, in the previous talk through that I was talking about in uh, Gable Knight 3, I talked about all the information you could find in the church just by clicking on all the portraits and stuff like that. Again, there is so much information in Gabriel Knight 3. And it's not so much that it's um, overbearing. Uh, like I said, if you're playing Gabriel Knight over a long period of time, it's easy to forget because there's so much information. But it feels more realistic that you can find information in this game that isn't always going to be applicable to giving you a clue or something like that. It's just general information of like, hey, this is what they know about XYZ, or this is what they know about this, and here are some notes about reincarnation and stuff like that. So the amount of work that went into producing all of this information is freaking incredible. And it feels very realistic that, there, like I said, there is more information here than you actually need. Uh, so you can spend a long time reading a lot of stuff on Sydney if you, if you, if you wanted to. It does kind of feel like the internet in that regard though, right? I did a search for vampires and now I'm reading about helper spirits. Like, how does that happen? <laughs> You ever do that where you're on the internet and you're searching for something and it's like, I don't know, 9 p.m. And uh, you finally take a pause because you're thirsty or you need to use the restroom and you look at the clock and it's now 4 a.m. And you first started researching apples, but now suddenly you're on a page about serial killers. And you're like, how did I get from apples to serial killers? Like, how did this happen? You can do the same thing on Sydney. You look up vampires and then suddenly you're, you're reading about shamans. So... It's not to the extreme of apples and serial killers, but there you go. I will say that is the one downside to using Sydney, that it doesn't operate like a browser. It doesn't have like a right click open in the new tab. So there would be times where I'd be reading a very long paragraph that has like four or five different links, and I'd click that next link, go down to the next one, go down to the next one, go down, and I'd have to hit back, like I'm doing now, a number of times to get to the original article I was reading. So I do wish that there was a way in Sydney that you can kind of like 
open quote unquote multiple tabs so that it becomes much easier to understand if you've already read this or not because there is a lot of information in here and there are a lot of links so like being able to open multiple tabs if you will would have been helpful in Sydney if you were trying to get the most out of this game or sorry the most out of the information that is being provided Or come to think of it, if they couldn't do multiple tabs, if there was a link where you've already read the information, like change the color of the link from yellow to blue or something. But even then, some of those that you've already read had multiple links inside of it, so not even that's a good option. The multiple tabs would have worked best. Just saying. Okay, maybe I lied. Maybe I will speed up some of this uh, because this is a long time of uh, a lot of reading, which uh, you can check out on the normal playthrough. So let me go ahead and zip through some of this. All right, naturally, as soon as I say let's zip through it, uh, I was pretty much almost done already anyway. All right, so as uh, Grace, we're gonna walk around, window open. And other than something that happens in a cutscene, I am not sure why that window opens, other than to perhaps say that it is something that can be opened. And if you look, there's a book. Well, that's strange, let's take a look. like one of the books from the bookstore that's closed. So who is leaving the mysterious gift? It has a poem in it, and she's going to leave it for Gabriel. But if you click it, you can read it, and it will provide a clue, because Grace is one that pretty much does all the research. Gabe just puts in the information. Is it me or does that look like a sandwich? And you can see sparks will fly between these two, but not in a positive way, as they both have a common interest. It's not the treasure, it's Gabe. And I, I talked about it in the other one. Um, I think it's interesting because I do believe that Jean may enjoy the company of men in terms of how polite he is when he speaks to Gabriel, but he's very short and kind of snappy with how he speaks to Grace. So now with Grace, we're kind of doing the same thing that I traditionally do um, when something new has happened and triggered. Uh, going to walk around, see if anything has changed or if there's anything to interact with or any people to interact with since we now got the book. Oh, and look, he's up here. I do like that they give the characters um, certain quirks also, like the way he always stands, he's always resting his hand on his gut. And uh, as a much older man, 
I completely understand. Uh, I try not to rest my hand on my gut. <clears throat> not that I have one, right? Because uh, I'm not old at all. <clears throat> uh, anyway, but they do have uh, interesting quirks like that. Like, um, you'll see the one individual who plays a very big part in the game. He will always walk around with his hand in his pocket. And uh, you'll notice, for some reason, it's very difficult to get his fingerprints. As a matter of fact, it's impossible. So no surprise, he's not inside here, because we just saw him outside with the binoculars. But if you look, there is now an English version of the pamphlet. So again, just wandering around, seeing if there's anything of note to interact with, or see, or overhear, or people that have moved to a different location. Grace will be able to eventually take the motorcycle, but most of Grace's role is indeed research. But uh, she will be the one to find some very vital stuff outside of La Reine Chateau. Can't take the motorcycle because Gabe has the keys. So it's a lot of walking around just trying to figure out what we need to do with Grace. Let's go see if Mosley is around. Looks like the tour is about to leave, and Mosley shows up just in time. So now Grace, who is a part of this tour, um, after she had spoken with the tour leader, her, uh, she takes the group around the tour and shows them uh, the tomb, which is over there right behind her. But if you notice, the guy who I was talking about that usually has his hands in his pocket, he's got a stick in his hand. And... Uh, She's showing off the postcards, which will come into play later. Um, he's got a stick in his hand. It looks like he's doing something every once in a while. Like when they cut to a scene behind him, like right there. Definitely looks like he's doing something. So definitely something about this game. You always have to keep your eyes open for those small little details. And now they all kind of finish. And now the first thing you want to do is see what he's doing. And he wrote some on the ground. It's going to be important to note that. Uh, doesn't sound like anything, but one of the things that Sydney can do is translate. And so we'll translate what some means. And that was the thing with the translations. Um, I was literally at times just going down the line of the various translation, like Italian to English, French to English, uh, <laughs> and just stuff like that until it actually properly translated. So during this time, you just kind of talk to everyone and eventually she'll say, all right, let's go to the next area. And from here, she talks about how it's a great vantage point and what used to be here. And so once again, this is where you can go when Grace, <laughs> every time I see her, she makes me laugh because uh, she always has the cool outlandish outfits. But uh, you'll eventually get a pair of binoculars for Grace as well, and she'll be able to come here and check out the sights. Now, what you want to do here is kind of listen to people and talk to who you can. And you're going to gather a little bit of information about each one. So even as you're listening to conversations, you'll see that others will move in and the conversation will continue and evolve. Wilkes is awesome. Uh, he cracks me up. 
he's uh <laughs> he's a chauvinist pig uh but <laughs> he's so over the top it's very hard to take him serious so once again you're gonna while you have time talk to everyone as you're overhearing more conversations and learning more uh conversation trees continue to open up to ask different people different things now that you're hearing more and more And really, to get the most out of the game, you should always talk to everyone uh, about every every uh, conversation tree branch that's available. I like his, uh, his shoulder twitch that he does. That. <laughs> uh... One of the things I do wish that they would have done, uh, especially during times like this where you're talking to everyone, is to be able to ask everyone about the others. Like, what do they think of them? And see if there's relationships between the others. Like, oh, you know, I don't trust this guy. Or, you know, I heard this guy said this. It would have been kind of cool to get uh, conversation trees. And on some of them, you can just like that. Um, but it would have been kind of cool to have all the guests pretty much be available to talk about. I have no idea what shirt Mosley is wearing. So during this part, pretty much Grace is doing a lot of information gathering. Because like I said, she's primarily the main person who does the research while Gabe does all the risky stuff and puts his life on the line. Quite literally, near the end. Um, Sierra games are notorious for being able to die quite frequently. If you look at King's Quest, you can die from falling off stairs. If you look at Space Quest, you can die from picking up a piece of metal. Uh, a quest for glory. Uh, you can just die on a random encounter while you're walking through the woods. Uh, every Sierra game, pretty much, death was around every corner, and the saying of save early, save often was born. Um, but here in Gabriel Knight, you actually cannot die that I'm aware of until right near the end. Alright, so we'll stop here and we'll go to the next segment. Alright, so we are on part four of the commentary, and it starts off with a vision that Gabe has with something to do with blood on his hand. And he finds that poem that Grace left behind. This segment is sped up a little bit faster than the other one because it is a pretty long portion uh, because Gabe does a lot of stuff. So it's a little bit longer than normal. So I sped it up. So it does have a little bit of a blur because <laughs> of how quick it's going. But essentially what's gonna happen here is during this part of the segment, the maid is cleaning out the rooms and what Gabe can do if he gets on the other side of the door. When she goes in, she'll block the door and you can't do anything. So what you have to do is wait until she does the first, uh, the sheets and stuff like that. And then you can click on the door and do sneak. And Gabe will attempt to sneak in. And where you can, you're going to open up these doors, these latches, because Gabe will be moving from room to room to basically gather information. A little bit on the illegal side, but hey, you know, that never stops Gabe before. And so we're going to get the... I went back for the uh, the fingerprint kit. Because we'll probably be using that for some of these rooms as she goes through and cleans them. I do think it's interesting that she's not concerned that there's this guy who, as she is cleaning, is just kind of standing in the hall watching her. And I like that, uh, you know, for some of the rooms, you actually have to go out into the, uh, the balcony and hide. And one of the things that I did, and I don't actually know if it's required, is I went through and all the rooms I snuck into, before I left, I also made sure to keep the door unlocked. So that makes going back into them much easier once the maid is done cleaning. I can just meander back in. I'm pretty sure you could probably do everything you need to do while the maid is in there. She probably won't actually exit the room until you exit the room.
I do like that she saw that was open. <laughs> she actually locked it on his. And so now with Gabe's, you can unlock it. Do a quick save, open it. And this took a second, but you can move to climb in. And you can go to the different rooms. The rope on the left will actually descend into the kitchen. So this is interesting that there is a glassing and there's a thing of Jesus, but no matter what you do, you cannot get any fingerprints off this thing. And the first time I was doing this, <laughs> I was because, and this is, uh, it might be in the manual because I did not look at the manual, but that was something that kind of threw me off is one of the first rooms I sneak into, it doesn't even tell you how to get a fingerprint. Like, you know, you get the duster and put the dust on it. But do you have to hold the mouse or do you just move the mouse over whatever you're trying to fingerprint? And the fact that that thing gives no fingerprint, uh, it's it's misleading because it, I wasn't sure if I was doing it right. So I was like going, as, as you see now, I'm going back and I'm just trying to grab a fingerprint. And I can't seem to do it. So I'm not even 100% sure if I'm doing it right. So I just figured I'd just keep moving on. As it turns out, you just have to hold the mouse and do it. But there are no fingerprints on that. And there's a reason for it that you'll find out near the end of the game as to why he has no fingerprints. So unlock the door, go inside and then try the rope and the rope will descend you down into the kitchen. And the game actually, you can see how Gabe's leg is in motion, his right leg. The game actually, and sped up, it still took a couple seconds, but game-wise it looked like it froze. It was stuck like that for a good minute, and I think I forgot to edit that out in the normal play. So where you can, go into everyone's room, kind of look around. Open drawers, check tables, look at everything. And if you're not certain, uh, save before you try it. So you'll notice there's another uh, spinny thing here. So you can get into other people's rooms. Again, check people's luggage, same thing. Fingerprint it, see if you get a fingerprint. Uh, you're gonna wanna connect, collect these fingerprints for, and actually, now that I'm looking at it, I think I did that fingerprint wrong. I just realized that I think I, I fingerprinted it, but I did not get the tape and then put it in the envelope. Just notice that. So that's probably some points that I missed. Uh, all right. But yeah, normally what you do is you fingerprint something when the fingerprint is there. Make sure it's good and dark. You take the piece of tape, put the tape over the fingerprint, then you take that fingerprint with the tape in it and put it in that envelope, and that'll uh, give you their fingerprints. And you'll notice he has some uh, religious clothing over there on the right. So there's something up with that, that he has religious clothing. Now we're in Wilkes' room, you can tell, because he has the uh, thumpomatic thing, and you learn that he's about to be published as well in a book. And basically try to fingerprint everything, which is what I'm doing right here. Like literally just clicking on everything and trying to get uh, fingerprints for everyone. And then our tour guide has a gun. That seems a little sus. But sure enough, you'll get a fingerprint off of it with the tape. And I, okay, I was about to say, I think I messed up again. Get the fingerprint off the hilt. And yeah. 
I messed up again. Tell me I do it right. <laughs> so, once again, it looks like... Alright. <laughs> I may have missed two sets of fingerprints now. But I think I get hers later on something else. But yeah, once again... Uh, it's, once you get it on the tape, you do have to click on the envelope. <laughs> so I'm already seeing some points that I missed now that I'm starting to understand why I think the gap of points I was missing was something like 40 points. And now in hindsight, re-watching it and remembering what I have to do as I played, I'm seeing things where I was like, yep, I think that's two fingerprints I've missed so far. So this whole mission of getting fingerprints not going well for uh, my version of uh, Gabe. That chest is locked. So this is one of those things where you're trying to tell it to look in the drawer, but it doesn't, the camera paneling doesn't work well. But there is an envelope between the sheets. And so while they're on the tour, all these people are on the tour, that's why they're not in their thing. They're out with Grace on the tour. And that thing that you just got is, um, it's a form of like lubricant, if you will. And so there is also a mirror. Let's see if we get the fingerprint. Uh, you know, it might be because it's sped up. I can't tell if I'm actually clicking on the, uh, on the envelope also. So maybe I am getting those fingerprints. I just can't tell right now because of how quickly it's being sped up. Like I said, the gameplay is like 16 hours, so there is a good chance I may have missed stuff like that. But maybe because it's being sped up that I am not seeing it going into the envelope. Because <laughs> I know I eventually get like a lot of people's fingerprints. So I must be getting them. It's just it's sped up so quickly. Because like I said, this segment was actually kind of longer than the rest. This one was almost an hour and a half. And I really don't want to talk for an hour and a half per segment. So I took it and I sped it up faster. So I actually reduced it down to 45 minutes and it doesn't trim the video. It just makes all of it move much, much, much faster, which is why you're seeing a little bit of the lines in the blur when Gabe is moving. Now I feel like I want to watch my normal playthrough and see if I did actually collect those fingerprints. Because if I didn't, I'm going to smack myself. <laughs> I remember that we tried to open that window and it was stuck, which once again, it's still stuck. But we may have a way of getting inside, make sure he is not home, get the uh, lubricant thing, ooze it on the window, and further open the door. Now, in here, this, there is an issue with the camera. So I'll show you in a second. So he has his desk, there's a bunch of stuff. And there's nothing really to get. So, Oh, and also if you go out to the office, you have to go all the way back around because the door is locked. Um, so when I was inside, you'll see it here in a moment. I tried to switch the camera and I can see the magazine now, right? So there's a magazine and then that's it. There's nothing to the magazine. Which seems very odd that you'd have to break into his office and there's nothing to get. So I was looking at the magazine, seeing if there's something there. There's the chessboard sort of represents the church, but there's no books, no nothing. And so I kept coming back to the idea that I am clearly missing something here. And so I tried shifting the camera around a few times. And I just, you, if you look at the save game, it's, it's literally called, seems like a lot of work for nothing or seems like a lot of effort for nothing. So I left, came back in, to see if I could change the camera view. And sure enough, when I pulled back, you can see something and it's a pack of cigarettes, which without, you can't get his fingerprints. So clearly that's why you had to break into that room is to get his fingerprints. 
but the way the camera is stuck, uh, that made that part really, really difficult and really, really easy to miss. Uh, that is perhaps one of the downsides of not having the typing interface of where you can just type look in drawer. And I'll say, oh, you see a magazine and a carton of cigarettes. Oh, cool. Get carton of cigarettes or get cigarettes. So it makes it very easy to potentially miss stuff in this game, which may account for why I'm missing something like 40 points, I think it is. Yeah, so it looks like I have the prints. So I was okay. That was one of the prints I thought I missed, so it's just that it's going really fast. And thankfully, when you do scan it in Sydney... Um... Oh, I did get Mosley's license, but it doesn't let me... I swear it's not in there for me to assign later. Huh. Uh, anyway, what's cool is when you're adding this stuff, it's all typed in automatically, so you do not have to remember whose fingerprints or give it its own unique name and stuff like that. You can put in notes here. You can actually type your own notes, which is kind of cool. But you can open files and associate things to them by linking them. The problem is with the way... <laughs> the way the uh, names are written, sometimes it's not always 100% easy to remember who is who. Like Abe, Abe is very easy. But Butch, but it's, uh, 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 I forgot how to pronounce the name, Pucharo or whatever. And the names are there, so it's actually kind of easy. I have to really applaud myself for the, how smooth that that transition is from the computer to the regular. <laughs> uh, if you don't know what I'm talking about, it's in the other ones where I talked about. I'm literally playing the game in 1920 by 1080, but every time I had to use the Sydney computer, I had a second shortcut that is 640 by 480. So I'd have to save in the 1920 game, quit, load in the 640 game, load, do whatever I had to do on Sydney, like now, and then save, and then load the uh, 1920 game. Now I could have probably just played the entire game in 640 by 480, but it's not as clean. And uh, you'll even notice if you watch the normal playthrough, it's probably impossible to see in the sped up one. But when I am using Sydney, where the mouse is, sometimes you'll see the, the letters start to blur. And I'm sure it's something to do with graphics card or whatever. It's like too strong or whatnot. Um, so I just wanted to play in the highest resolution. And my plan is after I do the commentaries, I'm actually going to upload the 1920 versions without the uh, Let's Play Sierra Games logo that I have on the left, just so that if anyone's interested, they can see the whole thing in 1920 by 1080p without the, uh, the left side or being squished. So we switch over to Grace, who, by the way, is uh, pretty brave. Uh, so we clearly have to do something around this vineyard area. And as you walk over here, you hear something that sounds like crying. And considering Gabe is looking for a kid to, uh, that was kidnapped, well, this could be a good spot. And this is what I mean by Grace is really brave. Like, <laughs> And then to climb on the... Uh, 
I couldn't remember if this was like King's Quest where like you had to move, but she actually does it on her own. So you're gonna look around and there's those weird uh the weird robes with that symbol. Now I had to restore and you'll see a restore happen. Uh, because I actually forgot to take a note of what that symbol looks like and have Sydney um, look at it because I just got caught up in like walking around and I thought I could just walk around but when you walk to a certain area it triggers that guy coming out and then when you open the chest and think that the baby's in there it's just a toy so there is still the sound of a child or something scary actually and here's a bummer so as I said I did not use the uh, pencil to get that symbol uh and i you know i just thought i could just walk back up there i'm just looking around that is incorrect and here's one of the places where i zoomed in on the inventory item so it's easier to read uh otherwise it's this tiny like whatever 640 by 480 image in 1920 resolution but uh when i reopen it i just leave it at its normal resolution which you can see it's much smaller now as always, check for fingerprints. And this is another room where, again, the camera is stuck. And I eventually move to an area where I can see something. So there's chairs that you can move and stuff like that. So you can look. And then if you look at the eye, there's something clearly up with his eye. So if you click on it, something else I zoomed in on. Looks like someone with a grail. And there's all those heads that are in this room. So you know there's probably something up with those heads too. Trying to see if there's a pentagram and then, oh look. If you move the camera around, which is almost impossible to see, this little button. When you press the button, the light goes off. Now here's where I thought, okay. We just need to make like a pentagram of some kind. So I'm just gonna move each one once and see. And sure enough, you make a pentagram and that opens a secret passage. Now the thing is, I still haven't got that writing from upstairs. And it tells you, ah, I don't want to go upstairs. But Grace, I actually do, because I need information from up there. So I actually had to restore back, go to the symbol, and see, sure enough, yep, you actually need to write that symbol down. I mean, you could probably proceed without it, um, but missing out on potential information. And just before he goes to look, someone calls out to him, and it's the tour. Ask him to come down and taste the wine with him. So now, I have to do the whole thing again. Move the thing, it's just a toy. Head downstairs. First, try to redo that button thing, which will then light up the lights. And then we still have to get the fingerprint. Read the book for some information. And then look at the grail in his eye, and you can see that's the normal size when I didn't resize it. Now, sorry if you hear my corgi barking in the background. Uh, but now we have to move all of these, and it's really easy actually. You just have to move them all to the right, and it creates a pen pentagram. And then head down the uh, creepy stairs, because it won't actually let you go in the door. So I was certain that one of those wine barrels was like a hidden passage, but no. Just have to find the downstairs, and you see this woman. If you go up to her, she'll grab you and she'll freak out. And she says something to Grace about the, uh, the blood of the vine. And after all that, go back, and he's like, hey, where were you? So, oh, you know, just looking around. All right, well, we're about to leave. Cool. And as they go, they make a horrifying discovery, 
Remember earlier I said that uh, it's not going to go well for the two guys uh, who are looking into the abducted son or abducted infant? Yeah, it does not turn out well for them. So now Grace is like, I, I am shocked. So now we're going to have Gabe do some investigation. And uh, it's no surprise, but he will meet Mosley while he's over there. So the glass to the door does come into play a few times, like here, where you can learn a few things. But overall, it mostly does not come into play. And uh, for Grace, she also gets a glass later. Um, it's found outside this room, I think, room 31, because they had ordered room service and put the plate outside. But unless I missed it, uh, I could not find where Grace uses the glass. And since I'm 40 points off, uh, it's a good chance I may have missed it somewhere. Here's Wilkes drinking some uh, hard whiskey. He offers Gabe a seat, says no, and then he comes out of that room and joins him. And so they start talking, which makes me think I probably missed something uh, with him being in that room. So a quick restore, and instead of talking to him, I head downstairs and go check on the, uh, the telephone area. So first, listen at the two doors. Then head downstairs and see if there is something to over here. Jean will talk to you first before you try to get over there. And you can see Wilkes drinking in the background. So head over there. And sure enough, he's there. And you can set the recorder to record, which is super creepy. <laughs> but uh, you will use it uh, because apparently you can scan it into Sydney. I'm not sure how. Maybe Sydney has a tape drive. Uh, literal tape drive and uh, she'll be able to translate the message and you find out there is far more to that guy like I said you did find like priestly clothing in his dresser so you already know there is something up to this guy and so he joins Wilkes for a drink and uh, pretty much neither one of them will talk to you as they just consume their drinks So no one is in here. And once again, just moving around, checking the area, seeing uh, since a few things have happened to see if anyone is in the church or any of the uh, surrounding areas. Again, as always, um, since you do learn more information, talk to everyone. They may have yet more information to give you about some of the things you're learning as you're moving through. So with him, you reveal that you overheard the conversation and uh, he gets upset about it. So doing that scanning thing with Gabe. Now I will say if you want to move the fastest, like when there's a long haul like that, it's best to push the camera as far as you can and then Gabe will just walk that distance versus just watching him walk. Unless you'd like to watch Gabe walk, that's always an option. Uh, there are times where I, like I said earlier, I tried to pan some of the scenes in a specific way. We're going to take note of those uh, tracks and see if we can find a car. Oh, no. So we found the car. And this was the car that those guys were driving in. And so you're going to use your notebook on the tire and get a tire print, see if we can find a car to compare it to. And uh, spoiler alert, we will find a car to compare it to, but things will turn very chaotic when that happens.
And so here's Mosley. Uh, apparently the cops have not shown up to the murder scene of these two individuals. You would think they would show up. But you find out that essentially uh, their throats have been slit. Uh, but more oddly is that it looks like their blood has been completely drained. Which leads to the idea that indeed vampires may be involved. But you'll find out why their blood is drained. So you definitely want to look at both of the bodies. And then start looking around. And I just passed it. Uh, I just passed it again. But you'll see there is a dark spot of blood. And if you look on the other side of the blood, just west of where Gabe's, well, where west of now of where he's standing, you can see something in the dirt as well. And so you'll want to look at that as well, and you'll notice that it's kneeling prints. So it looks like both gentlemen were kneeled down, and you get a vision, which I had to resize, and then uh, click it again, and you'll get another vision, which is a little bit longer, with their neck snapped. And then you're going to continue moving through and investigate the bodies further. You can talk to Mosley more about some of the stuff you'll see. Uh, but overall, nothing else. And as you leave, she shows up and she says that she's calling the cops. And Gay pretty much says, give me a chance to get out of here. I don't want the uh, cops involved. So even though Mosley was there, it doesn't really explain how he got there. Because he ends up getting a ride with Gabriel. So you come in here and talk to this guy, because you've learned more. And he will start talking about the Templars and the, uh, I believe they're called the Scion. Something of Scion. The Scion of something. been a week I can't retain the information and so he gets angry and tells Gabe to leave and then he gets on the phone to make a call and sets his alarm for two o'clock and then he leaves to go do something so now the hole comes into play so we need to do something so what we're gonna do so we're going to take the hanger in there. Totally not what I thought, but you find out what time Gabe sets his alarm to. You find out that it's set for 2 p.m. So now Gabe knows to make a uh, 2 p.m. call as well. So Gabe is going to try the same moves that Grace did. And he says, oh, you got to be crazy to try something like that, which I thought was pretty funny. So nothing to do at the vineyard. Now, one of the things in hindsight, we did see that guy leave his house and go down the path. We see them run into each other, and he's got something in that newspaper. So that newspaper will come into play. So now we just saw her leave, so we're going to follow her around. And that's going to unlock a different area. Where we can see she's digging, and you talk to her, and you find out that she's got information from some doctor guy or something like that.
there's my corgi barking. I don't even know if it's it's picking up on the recording. All right, so we've talked to her, gotten some information to, from her as to why she's here. So you call the guy who you're trying to find his son for, his infant son, and give him an update, tell him where it's at, what's going on, and he seems genuinely freaked out about all of it. Especially when you tell him that his two servants had been killed and that their blood had been drained. Grace is awake, and so you talk to her, and Mosley shows up. He's got a beer. You'll talk to them about the treasure and everything that you have just uncovered. Asking about the uh, bloodline of uh, the prince. Asking about the Templars, the Scions. Again, this the how detailed this game is is amazing. The way how you'll click something, ask something, and that'll feed more information to actually ask about. And then Grace continues reading the book and keep asking stuff. And then time to use Sydney. And this is what I was talking about where I was uh, just picking stuff to translate from. So for his, the recording is Italian to English. So one of the things I will say is, um, like, by attaching those, I think it's just for points, because I don't think it impacts the ending of the game. So we're going to get another fingerprint. And another fingerprint. He cracks me up. Oh, monsieur. So many people forget to say the kind things. <laughs> and Mosley, since he left a beer, we're going to go ahead and get his fingerprint. And then that's when she asks, what are you doing? Like, you know, it's Mosley. And he's like, well, he's been a little suspicious. So Grace says she will go ahead and add him into Sydney when she has a moment. So that brief second, you can see where how it looks in 1920 by... Uh, 1080 how the computer looked so i didn't do a good job trimming there here i am patting myself on the back and then i just saw where i actually failed to trim a little bit better and then uh, it's already gone but you can see how some of the lettering in the 640 by 480 even still looks clunky
we're going to go to the winery. And he says, yeah, no, the guy cannot talk right now. So earlier I was looking at Sydney. First, I'm going to go around everywhere. But uh, I'll say I was looking at Sydney and I was noticing that you can make ID cards. So that is something we're going to have to do. I'm going to stay away from the cops. Again, just checking out all the areas first, uh, because at this time I've not yet realized that I do need to make an ID card. I'm just seeing if uh, I have to trigger something else somewhere else. I'm just kind of driving around everywhere to see if there is something that needs to trigger to allow me to talk to the guy at the wine factory. Because the fact that he opens the door and says he's not available, definitely, definitely should be able to talk to him. So here's where you can make the ID card. And you do coroner, like freelance, reporter, and stuff like that. And so I made it and drove back. And you show the ID to him, and he's like, oh, yeah, you know. And then you pretty much lie and say you're a freelance reporter. You're writing an article about, you know, the fine tasting wine in the area, and you're going to be leaving soon. So I've heard great things about this place and love to sit down and talk to him and ask him about the wine. Uh, but as you do, he has a long tree of other things you can talk about. The Templars, the Scions, the wine, the uh, bloodline. He talks about it all. But mostly he talks about the bloodline of the grapes, if you will, and about how if you breed grapes a certain way, you'll breed the perfect grape uh, and stuff like that, which will make the best wine and the best... Uh, <laughs> He's talking about blood, but you know what I mean. I love the uh, the way Gabe talks during this interview. <laughs> the way Tim Curry does his voice is amazing because it clearly sounds like he's trying to do an accent, like on purpose on uh, poorly. Um, and just the way Gabe makes puns that are just falling flat, that's so well done. Then he gets a phone call and says, ah, you know, you'll have to excuse me. I have to go. But we'll come back and talk to him soon. And then Grace Mosley show up. Have a discussion about the weird guy. At the wine place. And everything that they found out. And Gabe and Mosley go out for a drink. I'm going to switch over to Grace. All right, so we're on day two, 5 p.m. to 10 p.m., where we are now Grace. And uh, the game only has a total of three days. Uh, the third day, everything goes down. And as you can see here, uh, Grace will pick up a glass, which, as far as I know, he can use to listen at the door. Um, if you try to fingerprint it, it'll say there's no fingerprints. So you can listen at the doors, but Grace, unless I missed it, uh, like I tried all the doors, Grace doesn't really hear anything. There's either no one there, or the fact that you'll just hear someone perhaps taking a shower or snoring. So I am not sure uh, what the glass is for for Grace, because as far as I know, she doesn't use it for anything else. So if you know what the glass is for, or if I missed somewhere where Grace was supposed to use that glass to listen to someone, feel free to let me know in the comments. In the meantime, Grace is going to be over here and she's going to ask the, um, the young woman behind the counter at the hotel some information about the, uh, the treasure, the Templars, the Scions, you know, and like, is she interested in the treasure? And she'll say stuff like, oh, you know, I've heard about it. But, you know, I've never really done anything about it. So now, since the time has changed, we're going to see what has changed around here. And from here, Gabe and uh, Mosley, uh, they're talking about Grace, essentially, and as well as the tour guide, 
woman who just showed up. And uh, Mosley will make a comment and go, ooh, yeah, no, she's really into you. And Gabe says, oh, it's just pheromones. It's what I give off. And so Gabe will kind of say that, you know, with Grace here, there's not much he can do in terms of uh, the tour guide woman uh, because, you know, she's kind of like a ball and chain. She's in his room, so it's not like he can take her back to her room because Grace would be there and stuff like that. So Grace gets kind of upset about it, and rightfully so, because these two clearly have some chemistry between each other. Uh, but it never really fully gets explored. And this young man here, who we can't seem to get any fingerprints of, more on that later, uh, he and Grace uh, get pretty close throughout this. He's very, very helpful, unknowing to Grace until she starts piecing it together, uh, that he is the one who is providing some extra information to Grace to help her make things happen. So, I'm going to go over here and take a look, see if there's anything. So the window's closed, can't open it. He's not home, doesn't want to do anything. It is somewhere between 5 and 10 p.m., so it's not shocking that he would not want to uh, be in his house. But if you go around to the side, you can talk to him, and you can ask him a few questions, such as the treasure, the scion, and stuff like that. But you can see it's pretty cool that they consider that and they closed his drape as well uh, from the inside. So. We've already got the pamphlet, so we're going to mosey on, but we can look at it. And once again, you can see I zoomed in, um, but in the future ones, uh, they'll be at the normal resolution, so they'll be smaller. But when I initially looked at it, I wanted to zoom in so you can actually read it, uh, because you're going to get something known as Le Supin Rouge, and uh, that pamphlet is going to come in real handy in terms of how to resolve things. So I gave it a quick read just to see if he would have anything else to discuss. And if you look on that door, it sure looks like there is something there, and it's closed. But then Grace goes right back down. But, you know, let's take a look at that envelope. And it's a copy of Le Serpent Rouge, which is what I was just talking about. So someone is clearly leaving Grace little hints. And it is, I believe his name is pronounced Buccelli. Or no, uh, sorry. Uh, wait, I totally can't remember his name now. Anyway, it's the guy who we can't get any fingerprints off of. It's him. And uh, his secret will be revealed. Try to get fingerprints. And there is one. It's interesting that Gabe and <laughs> Gabe and Mosley are inside talking that we just saw, and yet Gabe's motorcycle that he rented is missing. Because there he is, he's right there. So it's curious why his motorcycle would be missing. Could be that the guy who owns it uses it for his own personal one, so that could be. And here we go, adding data into Sydney. And that is the drawing from the, um, the robes from the winery. That's the note. That what's his name was scribbling on the uh, ground. Emilio, there we go. Buccelli is the uh, the uh, bald, baldish dude, the priestly guy, I believe, if I remember correctly. Now the thing that's weird is what you can and cannot scan into Sydney. So, for example, you can scan in a cassette tape that you record, 
not sure how. Uh, but you can't scan in some papers of La Serpent Rouge for Sydney, but you can scan a fingerprint. So it's kind of weird. Uh, so we're going to do some more translating to find out what sum is. And this is where <laughs> it gets crazy. Uh, so Sydney will diagnose these things and say, hey, there's some geometry shapes I'm seeing in these messages, as well as some letters, and then you can try to translate it. And then when you translate it to French, it'll say, ah, then give you some information. And it'll also tell you that it can see some things. And so, and I don't know how it sees that symbol in there, but whatever. So you can keep translating this stuff. And where there is a symbol, it'll tell you. And these symbols will be able to be used by uh, Sydney, which is which is weird. Like, if I haven't found a square, I can't just draw a square in Sydney. And when you analyze it, it'll find other symbols. It talks about the rotation. So, this is where it gets haywire. And uh, <laughs> for the sake of my own sanity of uh, having to relive this, I may speed through this uh, and not comment because it drove me crazy trying to figure this part out. Uh, it, was, it was a lot of stabbing and just hoping for the best. Like, for example, one of the things I noticed when I was, see, like I'm just clicking on the grid, draw, like, no, that's not it. So I started, I wasn't even sure how to move this map around. So you have the left and the right, and uh, I was trying to drag the left side. That's not how you do it. Click on the right side, and that's where it'll zoom in on. And you can see I'm drawing points on the map, and things are going crazy. And you can tell this is a different save game, because now you can see the frame of the computer. Uh, and this one... Uh, I think this was 1024 by 768 to see if it would work better because I was having issues with the map. And see, I can see that cross. So I was starting to think, okay, maybe that cross is the key and I just need to find all these crosses in these different cities to see if I can make a triangle or a pentagram or something. Because you see those shapes in those messages. <laughs> this took a ridiculous amount of effort. So you can see I got two of them, right? But that third church up to the north doesn't count right now. But at least I got two right so far. So the struggle is real <laughs> without using a walkthrough. So now I'm just trying to draw essentially a triangle to see if that's it. Because um, you have that t top and then the two at the bottom. But yeah, you know what? For the sake of everyone's sanity and me just talking about this, I'll go ahead and just fast forward this portion of it. And let's uh, hang tight as we just bypass the insanity that is Sydney. If you watch the regular playthrough, you can watch it all. Uh, here's where I'm just, uh, <laughs> I'm just trying to draw a pentagram or something or make these things match. Like, do they have to be inside the circle? How is that? <laughs> All right, I'm just going to start fast forwarding now. All right, so now we're back as gray. So we've got a circle. Took a lot of effort just to get a circle and figure out what to do with that circle. <laughs> and since something has happened, we figured out the circle, we go downstairs, there's Kay, Mosley, and the uh, tour guide, and they're gonna go out for drinks or whatever and have some fun. And Gabe actually makes a comment that, no, Grace wouldn't wanna go, you know, she's too busy doing research. And Grace overhears it, and she would probably like to go and not stuck be stuck doing research. So we're going to go over here, see if they have anything to say first. Uh, 
And I like that she keeps forgetting Grace's name. All right, so once again, we're gonna to try to decipher this code. Blue apples is a code word if you uh, search in Sydney for grapes. I already know that because I've already done that search, but There is that symbol with the circle that is in the square that we saw in one of the messages. So that is what I'm trying to recreate here. And uh, it's a nightmare. I'm just spinning in circles, literally, or spinning a square in a circle, spinning a square outside of a circle. Anyway, let's just uh, go ahead and fast forward this part too. So all that because I missed part of the meridian, which is part of that puzzle thing, where it says it'll be on the horizon of the meridian, whatever. So you actually have to have it and then it locks in place. <laughs> and I save that game as I hate this part of the game, seriously. All right, anyway. So back to it being interesting, we're back to being Grace, figured out another thing, and now something else has happened. Now they're talking, and they want to pay, uh, I believe it's Bridge, and they need some more players, and once again she <laughs> invites what's-her-name and then says Grace to play. And so once again, now that they've all had a drink, you can use the uh, thing. And they'll say, I already have his, but that one guy, Emilio, we still never got his fingerprint. And still, yet again, no fingerprint for Emilio. Why? Why? All right. So they're over here enjoying a good game of bridge. And Grace is going to go out and do some exploring. So now that we have figured out part of the riddle and read some more, we now have more questions to ask him about the uh the sunrise which we just found on the map or sunset i think it's sunset it's either sunset or sunrise see literally i just beat this game uh it's probably been like three or four no it's been like well shoot i think it's probably been almost a week now since i beat the game and i've already forgotten what all the clues are now see this thing this thing, I know you're supposed to do something with it because it talks, she even says when you click on it, oh, this is the uh, angels from part of the riddle thing. And so I know you're supposed to do something with the hand gestures and I could not figure out what it is. So as Grace begins to look at Le Supra Rouge, uh, it'll highlight the parts that she has to figure out first but I zoomed in so you can read everything really close uh, for the first time. And as you click it, Grace will actually read the lines. So if you're wondering why there is a pause, that is why. If you watch the playthrough, she's actually reading each of the lines. And 
And so what I always try to do is, uh, I did it in Gamer Night 2, Gamer Night 1, I want to get the most out of the game. If there's something where the character will read it, I want to click it and just listen to it uh, to get the most experience out of the game. Stuff that they've clearly programmed in, intended to be heard or seen. I still haven't looked at the walkthrough for Gabriel Knight 3 to see what I might have missed. Because there is a pretty huge gap in terms of points that I'm missing. Um, so I should look at that sometime. I will say one thing that is pretty cool that um, Grace has done all this research and in day three at the end of the game, Gabe is separated from her, but he's able to basically radio her in for help on what he's facing. And I think it's pretty cool that stuff from that pamphlet and the Supreme Rouge and stuff like that are, uh, are part of what Grace can help you with. Now, I'm surprised no one is bothered by the fact that there is a spirit just holding up a glass of wine. I'm joking, it's a bug, and it happens a few times in my playthrough where I walk out and the glass is simply floating in the middle of the air. All right, here we go with more Sydney. So now, With the chest thing, it talks about, you know, the 8x8 eight eight or whatever. Uh, so, uh, good old Wilkes shows up and says, Hey, uh, I can show you what I found in terms of the treasure if you just go out on a date with me since the tour guide has left with Gabe. And so Wilkes is drunk and tries to basically uh, get fresh with Grace, but she keeps slapping him away but pretending to be innocent at the same time, and she's asking him about what his thumper has found. <laughs> and when she says something about the treasure, he says the treasure's right here, <laughs> and takes her hand and grabs it and thrusts it towards her crotch. Or towards his crotch. Uh, to which Grace uh, rightfully uh, flips him on his ass. <laughs> I will say that uh, Gabriel Knight 3, uh, since I just said ASS, um, Gabriel Knight 3 probably is not for children. A, because it does have a lot of... It's a pretty thick story. Uh, but on top of that, Gabe and Mosley, and I think everyone, pretty much swears at some point. Just trying to see if there's anything I can get. See what has changed around here. I love the lighting on that church, the way they did that. And the church is closed. Sealed shut tight now. As you would expect, everything between 5 and 10 is currently closed, except for the tower. You can just go right on up. I try to use a binoculars up there. He pretty much says, well, it's nighttime. I can't really see anything. <laughs> So just looking around, we can see that there are no motorcycles in the area, so probably no one around. But regardless, uh, just checking anyway, 
because last time Mosley somehow got up here without a, a motorcycle. So just driving around, looking around, no motorcycle. Let's get out of here. Just trying to see where to go next. No motorcycle. All right. And no motorcycle. All right, let's go. Oh, a moped. Someone is here. So let's go see what's going on. Well, 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 if it isn't our buddy, mostly. So I love that Gabe just sneaks up on him. <laughs> and you find out that Mosley and the uh, tour instructor woman, they've actually kind of teamed up in regards to locating this treasure. So we know Mosley's into the treasure or something along the lines. So we can spy on him. And that's right. I should go back and talk about how the alarm was set for 2 a.m. because we saw his alarm was set. So we asked the hotel to do a 2 a.m. wake-up call. So we know that he's doing something at 2 a.m. and it looks like he's burying something. And this time Gabe is pretty brave and not moving. We can kind of see where he is doing it. And so this is so funny. I basically leave to go get my shovel walk all the way back and when I get there it tells me that I can't use it like there's no way to grab it so it's in the inventory automatically which I should have paid attention to and not assume that it's just on the bike so I gotta walk all the way back find that hole and dig away And it's funny because he says, let me go get my shovel and walks off screen and walks right back. And so when you look, it's basically what appears to be the lineage of uh, Jesus. And there's a fingerprint there, which we can probably guess is his. Just checking to see if finding it does anything with him, but it does not. He's nowhere to be seen. So we're just going to go ahead and leave the area. And then we see a car go by. But it went by too fast, but it looks like it did leave some tracks. They sure look familiar. So we can confirm that probably the people who killed the two guards are also people who hang out at that winery. So Gabe will be uh, headed back that way shortly as a reporter once again. But when he goes home, he checks in. Then he has a dream of these three weird looking guys who zap the unicorn slit its throat and drink its blood now it seems offbeat this whole unicorn thing and the guy growing a horn and drinking the blood but you'll find out why there's this where it looks like a vampire has floated into the room and oof, wow cut uh grace's shirt open 
Uh, by the time Gabe is actually able to stand, the window's closed, and she's still laying there. Shirt still closed, laying on her side. And Gabe lays next to her, concerned about her, takes his amulet, and you can assume what happens next. Alright, so we are going to begin day three. Grace wakes up, Gabe is in the bed. Um, if you watched the previous one, uh, you know that it would appear that Grace and uh, Gabe finally uh, expressed their uh, desire for one another in a very physical way. Um, it does cut to black, so you don't see anything, but it is pretty much assumed because you'll see some conversation and stuff like that. And, by the way, I don't know if Grace has like, uh, been on her trip for a long time, but I noticed uh, Grace has a pair of jeans with a nice tear on the rear end. Kind of sexy. Um, <laughs> but clearly, this is an indication that uh, she's down to the last bits of her laundry, because normally I could not imagine... Uh, Grace wearing any kind of pants that would have like a tear in the rear end like that. Grace is uh, too civilized for that kind of clothing. So, I just thought that was funny. Or she could be <laughs> she could be wearing Gabe's pants. Alright. So we're gonna make our way around it is a new day, see if anything has changed. Walk around to all the usual places. Uh, talk to all the usual people that are available. And uh, as I did mention, the tour guide talks about one of the postcards of the tomb. And uh, when you come here, you can actually get three postcards in total. So I kept spinning it around until it finally said no more. And there are three that you will end up scanning into Sydney, which is going to find some more diagrams on these random paintings, uh, which you'll use uh, to figure out more of what's going on with the Templars, the Scion, the uh, Blood of Christ, and all that fun stuff. So we've got the postcards, but first we're just going to take a drive around, see if anyone is around. This segment, you might notice it's kind of blurring kind of fast. Um, it was probably like an hour and a half, so I kind of sped it up further to be about 45 minutes. Um, it may be less than that by the time I'm done. If there's dead air, I'll probably uh, speed up those sections a little more. Um, but so if you're wondering, this is moving really fast, like there's a lot of blur, uh, that's why it is actually uh, sped up quite considerably. This puzzle uh, was a little frustrating. So one of the first things I just went, I snuck into Mosley's room because I have his key. Uh, the first thing I did was click on the pile of clothes on the floor and I said, no, you know, I want to look around more. Well, the thing is, you have to look at everything else in the room. Then you can look at the pile of clothes and she'll go, oh, I guess so. So that was uh, that's a little misleading also that you don't just look there and get what you want. So there is a few kind of gotchas in Gabriel Knight. So now we have found the six-pointed star. So we now have a new symbol. And we found some more paragon symbols and that should look somewhat familiar with the line and everything like that. We got some translations to go and we had the sum which we translated so then when you translate it'll update the text. Ah, here we are with Sydney again trying to figure out more things. Uh, so we're going to find a line there. Let's keep on moving. And this is what I mean. See, so I came back and you have to look at everything else. Look under the bed. You know, we've already checked the jacket. She finally looks at the pile of clothes, even though that was the first thing I clicked on. So now you have Mosley's uh, 
whatever you want to call it, the gyrometer thingy. So, and uh, we'll use that to try to pinpoint a few things that are mentioned in Le Sapin Rouge. So we're going to look at the rocks and she'll say, oh, hey, those rocks look familiar. And if you go inside, there's a note. So someone is giving Grace clues. It should already be clear that it's Emilio, because he's one who wrote some and stuff like that. So now she's compared the rocks, and so she knows that somewhere around here, the postcard talks about a center. So we need to find the center, which <laughs> I was literally just walking around until it told me I found it. You can just see me frantically clicking around. <laughs> this does take a few minutes, uh, but yeah. If I remember correctly, it ends up pretty much being right, <laughs> right in front of the cave. I'm like way off, just walking everywhere. Let's let's try the near the front of the cave. Oh, there it is, right in front of the cave. <laughs> so then Grace goes and gets her shovel and digs, and nothing. That's gonna happen to a few times to poor Grace. So again, here's the tires. You can look at it. And she says, Gabe should look into this. Go ahead and leave. And now we see, I think, is it Madeline? I can't remember her name. I think it's Madeline, but it's the tour uh, guide woman. And she's digging in the same spot that Mosley was. And she pretty much says, hey, if you see your friend, he better not have found anything, because those two are clearly working together. And nothing ever comes of that chicken, other than when you talk to, uh, I believe her name is Sophia, the, the female who works the night shift at the, uh, at the hotel. She talks about how her mom plans on catching that chicken because it's terrorizing her. Uh, yes, back to Sydney. I zoomed in this time because this is going to help us figure out La Sabrina Rouge which is uh, what we're going to do next and try to figure out piece by piece the whole thing. So we're looking at different churches, different things that the manual mentions. It is funny that I talked about earlier about how versatile this thing was, uh, Sydney, how they had put a bunch of information but some of the very um, the very saints and stuff like that are mentioned in the church are not mentioned uh, in Sydney. Which I guess could be, since Sydney is uh, for the Schottnagers. I uh, just thought it was something that they could have just put something in there to talk about it, since they are mentioned in the church. But there is, like I said, a metric ton of information in Sydney that you can just keep going down a rabbit hole. All right, so now I'm going to try to find out the next part to the uh, Sydney puzzle. I'm going to try to enter in a few more points, because if we do the thing that uh, Wilkes found, he can start figuring out shapes. Now we have a similar shape to what we saw earlier, and if you turn it, bang! So Gabe wakes up after that, and uh, there's clear discomfort between the two, and they're uh, in their conversation very uncomfortable talking to each other. Mosey gets a look at the lineage, and you can see he looks kind of sly right there. That lineage book is about to disappear. 
and it's going to be very clear who's taking it because you'll see him walking with basically what looks like a towel. When you go over here, you find out that the maid says, hey, Wilkes, uh, he's not come back. Um, like his bed is unmade, like something happened with Will. <laughs> something happened with Wilkes. Sorry, the reason I laughed is <laughs> there's a conversation tree with this quote unquote attractive uh, nurse, <laughs> or nurse, what am I saying? Uh, maid, sorry. <laughs> Too many fantasies are in a ring. <laughs> uh, but uh, one of the options that you talk to her about is, uh, I think it's bondage. <laughs> and Gabe is actually the one who comments on it. Like, yeah, still into that, are we? <laughs> I just thought that was pretty funny. All right. Anyway, so we're in, we're in Wilkes's room trying to piece together what it is that happened to Wilkes, why he disappeared, what is going on. Um, the windows are open, which is very indicative of the dream that Gabe had of the vampire, since it is on a second story. Uh, if the person gained entrance through the window, they either used a ladder to get up there, or they just floated up there like the vampires that Gabe saw in his dream that came for uh, Grace. So when you ask about around with Wilkes, no one has seen him. Uh, there is concern. Uh, some think he might have drank somewhere and just passed out. Well, he drank something, uh, or someone drank something of his, primarily his blood. It's just a matter of finding it. So now we're just going to drive around. Now that we know Wilkes is missing, hey, there is a moped here. Uh, and it's his. And Emilio, when you talk to him, he says, I'm just meditating. And he's looking at the tomb, because the tomb is directly across. So, Emilio is very mysterious. He has no fingerprints. And I keep alluding to that, and uh, you'll find out why later. So he, tr <laughs> he tries to shut the door on you, because he's upset that Gabe dug up the uh the lineage thing and so gabe will ask him about vampires and stuff like that and ask him about the uh, lineage of the uh the the infant so Got a lot of information out of this guy, and we're gonna head on out. Keep looking. No motorcycles or, or no mopeds, so we're just gonna keep looking. However, this time, if you look closely right at the base of that thing, now, you're not able to go up there until you figure out how to click these footprints. And that was frustrating, because you can see how the tile on those look different. And basically, you have to find that they're footprints, and you find a note on him. His throat has been slit. All too familiar, just like the two guards, just like the unicorn. And, oh, there's a pool of blood. So if Gabe looks at it, yeah, definitely looks like Wilkes met the same end as those other guys. Which is a bummer. Uh, like I said, I actually enjoyed, <laughs> despite his chauvinistic pig behavior, uh, he was a... Oh, so, you just saw her leave Mosley's with a towel. Oh, here's the... Uh, <laughs> the bondage tree, if I remember correctly. Gabe says he's not into... Uh, I was tempted to try to drink one of those, but I was pretty sure it was going to kill me. Um, but we just saw... Madeline, I think her name is. Uh, we just saw her leave uh, Mosley's apartment. She's holding a towel. 
And like I said, we saw Mosley giving that lineage book uh, an eye. So Gabe is about to find out that the lineage book is gone. And that is because Mosley took it. And I believe her name is Madeline. I can just call her that. The tour guide lady. She takes it from Mosley because she plays Mosley. And then someone will end up taking it from her. And you will see them each time basically walking around with this towel in their arms, indicating that's what they're hiding. And so go over, talk to Grace, find out about all the things that she's uncovered and all the things that Gabe has uncovered. And they're truly making progress where Gabe is focused on trying to find the infant. Grace is interested on figuring out the uh, Le Serpent Rouge. Uh, and the idea that there is some kind of Templar treasure, blood of Christ thing. So now we are switched over to Grace. And we, uh, the time has shifted. So now, see, now we just see him moving and he is holding the, the towel thing. So it essentially went from Mosley to Madeline to him. Uh, what's his name? Buccelli. So that will come into play. You'll have to actually say who did what and in what order. And you get to overhear these two wonderful ladies who are now desperate to find the treasure, but they're starting to worry that the information they got is incorrect. So they're so distressed they really don't want to talk to Grace, and Madeline doesn't really want to talk to Grace either. Oh, looks like there is a gap in the in the thing here. I'll need to cut that out. But we're back on Sydney now. Cruising along. Trying to figure it out. Uh, I will probably speed this through if it takes too long. Because I spent way too much time trying to figure this out. And that river in the north is Le Serpent, which leads right to the um, the winery. So now we know the uh, the father of the infant is here, and Gabe will be heading into that house pretty soon. Oh, and see, you can see a few new opened areas, huh? So we're gonna walk around, figure some stuff out. There is a uh, like handkerchief. You can tell that wall has to move. Uh, it's just a matter of how. We're gonna keep moving along. And Grace uh, tried that path to the north where Gabe fails to keep going. Uh, when you go as Grace, there is a note pinned to the tree, uh, which is another clue that someone is just giving. And uh, there will be a site to dig there in a moment. Uh, spoiler alert, Grace isn't going to find anything. So when you get here, there's another note. Uh, but you can't really get anywhere because it's all fenced off. So we need to find another way around. So if we go back up here, there is another center point, which I just walk around until I found it. Put an X. Click on it, and Grace will say, let me go get my shovel, come right back and dig, and say, yeah, now there's nothing. It's like pure rock. So. Gonna check out the binoculars, see if we spy anything. Essentially doing the same thing I do with Gabe, where I just spin until I see anything that says I can zoom. Then I zoom and see if there's actually anything there worth seeing. So, in this case, there's 
pretty much nothing that's immediately visible, but... And I was struggling to get down from there. I had to change the camera view. We did spot someone's moped when we were looking through the binoculars. And there was a place called the Orange Rock that became unlocked. If we look, to me that looked like a rock, so that was a little misleading as to what I need to do, but apparently it's just sand. And when you dig it up, you actually find the lineage book. So now we're going to get a number of fingerprints from people who actually touched it. So there are the three fingerprints, and it's going to be the three people that I already told you. Mosley, Madeline, and uh, I believe his name is Buccelli. Or Buccelli. These two are amazing, as always. Uh, she... <laughs> lady what's her name has uh is it estelle i think it's estelle doing all the digging as she sits there and just it <laughs> lays down now notice there is that water bottle at first it looked like a camera when i first looked at it but it's a water bottle uh notice that it's there because you will come back uh, and you can get fingerprints off of it if you haven't already got their fingerprints so now you go back into the hotel and the father of the infant who had hired Gabe is there. And he says, hey, when you see Gabe, tell him to come see me. that you can just do the analyze thing and tells you whose fingerprint it is. It just attaches it. So the gigometer thing basically says it's right here. And Grace <laughs> just moves one rock and they all fall. But there's another note. So all these notes are things to basically look up in Sydney that'll give you more clues as to what to do. Now remember how uh, in the other commentary I was talking about how Emilio, he walks around with his hand in his pocket, and he's also the one that we can't seem to get a fingerprint on. Those things are connected. So now, the time has moved. I just realized I failed to do a zoom in on the, on the time. And so Gabe is making the acquisitions about who stole the, uh, the lineage paperwork. And this is where everything comes out. So Madeline is working for the European government, Mosley reveals that he's working for the CIA, and Puccello is working for some religious um, organization about everything. Now what's interesting is he only called in these three, assuming because they are the accomplices, like he doesn't call in Lady, whatever her name is, and Estelle. We know Wilkes is dead. Uh, Emilio is also not here. So we already know that Gabe pretty much knew who did it, just had to figure out the uh, right order. And uh, when she flirts with Gabe, uh, Grace doesn't take it well. Especially since they just recently slept together. So before we go see... Uh, I believe he's a prince. Before we go see him, we're just going to scan around and see if there's anything that we need to see before we trigger that. Okay, nothing seems to be there. And that's the uh, guy who lives up in the cabin. So, the one who you uh, took the... Uh, 
the lineage from that he buried. I should have really wrote down all the characters' names so I could have had that handy uh, as I was doing the commentary, because there are so many characters in this game. And it had already been, uh, I think, like a week, so all of that information is gone out of my brain because there is very, very limited space <laughs> left in my old brain to remember things. And when you talk to him, you ask him about if he's met these guys, and he declines it, and then Gabe calls him out for meeting some of the guys, and uh, he gets kind of upset about being called out. So now we're going to go here. There's a guy whom we took the lineage stuff for. And thankfully, Gabe has recovered and says, hey, my bad, you can have it back. And they start talking about the child. They start talking about the treasure, the Templars, the Scion, uh, what it means about the grape line or the grape vine, you know, like the, uh, the way they breed grapes and stuff like that, the purity of it. And so this other guy is going to go ahead and go with you. Um, when you go after the... Uh... Now, if you look, there's a water bottle. Um, but when you go after the guys who have taken the child. So there's fingerprint. And I think this is one of my favorites where she's just laying down snoring while, uh, I believe it's Estelle, it's just digging away. And Estelle is like so sympathetic of, oh, uh, you know, she came from money, she, you know, she's distraught that we've not found it yet. <laughs> uh, it's so good. So we talked to Grace about some of the things we found. And she shares some of the information she's found on the Sydney computer. That's the name, Larry Sinclair. All right, so now Gabe is finally able to climb over the fence, and this is where he basically says, hey, I'm so sorry, uh, you know, I'm about to leave. I want to finish up this article and write up more because he suspects something is up with this guy. And how he has something to do with the abduction of the infant based on all these things that are pointing. And so they go to a wine cellar and he drops it. Gabe cuts himself and this guy drinks it as it drips into, I mean, Gabe's blood dripped into the wine and uh, he just drinks it. So you go inside here, turn on the light, and I was sure that you're supposed to do something with the tire tracks here because the car is hidden. And maybe you are. Maybe I just missed it, but I was trying. But you end up looking at the bats, and this will trigger a cutscene where, sure enough, it's those vampires who are now chasing Gabe. And it's now three, two, I think it said nine. So now we are back to being Grace after that brief stint as Gabe. And talk to Estelle about a few things and she agrees to show Grace some photos and talks about each of the photos and Grace was like hey can you just let me look at it and that's like the doctor who gave them the information and there is a item that Grace just put in her pocket it's a circular item that has two prongs uh, and basically it's what the vampire bite thing is marked and so this is an email that you get back in regards to the symbol that you sent. There's the uh, photo. And uh, 
it'll come into play. You'll see how it's used and stuff like that. So just moving through the rooms, trying to see if there's anything to do. Once again, another floating drink. The uh, Rennes Le Chateau is haunted by paranormal. And now we see this guy leaving. So let's tail him and see what is going on. Now remember previously I talked about how Grace does kind of the same thing that Gabriel does. This guy bows to him and talks about his holiness. Uh, so this guy clearly has a much larger secret. And see how Grace doesn't even move? Grace just... Gabe moved around the other side of the tomb as they were coming. Uh, Grace did not. Grace just sat there like, uh. <laughs> so. so if you follow him to his room, you can talk to him and confront him about what you just saw. And this is a long, long cutscene that... I can't even begin to explain it, but it's basically the lineage of Christ and how these guys came to be with the Templars, the Scions, and the son of Jesus, and Magdalene, and the guy who was so devoted to him who couldn't let um, Jesus be crucified, so he drank his blood and got betrayed, and all this stuff that Jesus is upset that he drank the blood and said, you didn't let me do what I was meant to do. And this guy who's super angry and wants the power of the Chosen One slash Jesus. And uh, he gets called out by his brother and exiled. Uh, it's a long story that uh, I can't even begin to explain in full detail. Uh, I'd highly recommend playing. or playing. You could play it and still see it. But watching my normal playthrough. And uh, if you want the whole story, <laughs> it's all there. But it's actually really good and really well done. I am sure if someone is of religious faith, they may not be as happy with it, uh, indicating that perhaps that Jesus had children and stuff like that. So, but I thought it was well done and very tasteful. And so now they've gathered, I'm talking about they have to do something. Grace talks about this hole that she found, and Gabe's like, I got it. And so he slides down. <sighs> so the first thing I did is when I looked at this, I, <laughs> I assume because it's Gabriel Knight, that you have to move in knight positions and eventually land on all the swords. What I didn't know the first time playing it is I just thought, don't land on one of the skulls and you're okay. Like... If you land on one of the black tiles that doesn't have a sword on it, you're fine. And overall, that's the case. But the tile only lasts once. So I'm not sure... I mean, I'm sure if you land... I don't think I ever tested it, but I never landed on any of the death tiles. But see how I just jumped off that tile? Now it's gone. So I figured you have to do all the night moves. And I... I thought I pretty much already messed up by this point because I didn't realize the tiles will drop. So I've already lost two tiles. And I'm you can see my mouse frantically moving in the order of how a knight would move across a chessboard table. And in hindsight, it's probably more in relation to not so much Gabriel Knight, but the Knight Templars, which makes way more sense. Uh, because they probably would have not known that Gabe was coming here <laughs> to jump on these swords and perish. <laughs> I thought I had it. Uh, so what I ended up doing is I took a screenshot of that. And I actually saved and basically wrote down all the night moves and every variation that I could find. And I don't know if there is more than one way to do it, which is why I'm saving. Uh, but this took a while to figure out that you can only land on tiles once. But being able to screenshot that screen first, and then basically just writing down, like, move one, move two, move three, uh, really helped. I would not have been able to do this without writing it down. There's no way. And so one of the cool things, like I said, I should have mentioned, that, um, during these puzzles, you can talk to Grace.
and so <laughs> you will see me die. I don't know if I, I can't remember if I put them all, <laughs> but I think I died probably well over 30 times <laughs> on the pendulum. And I eventually figured out that there's a timing thing. You have to time it where the hand is available to grab at the top. And when you do, uh, you can actually grab the thing and swing down and then drop here. So you call Grace and she says, oh, you know, it's the essence of life. So which is like the, I think it's the apple for the blue apple and the egg, which is birth and stuff like that. And then he goes on to speak more. Um, and essentially he reveals that he scrubbed away his own fingerprints eventually. Um, and that's why every time we tried to do anything, we couldn't find it. And you find out he is thousands of years old. And that's why that guy that we saw him in the graveyard with Grace um, bows to him, because he is actually a holy person. And uh, it's pretty interesting because he talks about how he couldn't do anything. Um, so in this puzzle, you have to, you know, unless you know what language that's in, you reach out to Grace to find out what to do. Now this one was kind of tricky because I picked up, you know, 50-50 chance, I picked up one of the gloves, tried to click on the fire thing, nothing happened. So I'm clicking on everything else, trying to see if I need to do something. And what you have to do is shift the camera above those things in order to click it. There you go. And then so you put the glove back and then you have a choice between what looks to be an angel and what looks to be a demon. And in the book, it talks about Asmodeus was the guardian. So I selected the demon, seemed to go right. And this part, I this was pretty much like a, a lucky guess. Like they both kind of show the same thing. When you step on it, it just looks like Gabe is old. So, and then the other one shows that Gabe is young, so, you know, I guess we all age. So we need to figure out what to press. That opens up that. Now there is a bridge over there. It seems pretty logical, but there's also what you can see is clearly uh, another bridge, but there's nothing there. So good old uh, Indiana Jones style, I believe it was. You just use a leap of faith. And I died a lot because the floor tiles disappear on you. So, like I said, you don't die in Gabriel Knight until you reach the very end. And then death is just everywhere. I'm so close. I got it. I got it. Yeah. And everyone else makes it effortlessly. And then the vampires show up. And they break out their swords and guns. And you go through. Here's the winery guy. And uh, this took me a few tries. Because what I was trying to do was go into the inventory to use the um, medallion. And it took me a few tries that I see that when I clicked on the inventory. See, I'm in the inventory and it's not there. But when I go to right click, it's the medallion's already there. So, again, dying quite a few times. And then you slice his throat after you use the medallion. His throat gets slit. Come down, get the child. He takes it. And there is a tomb there. And uh, they say open it. And uh, Gabe is, uh, sees a vision. And it looks like he is the one who perhaps um, put the nail to Christ and said, hey, Christ said, give me your dagger and I'll bless it. And that's the dagger that he uses as a part of the shot dagger. So Grace looks at that picture that's been on Sydney and gets a flash also. Emilio takes this glowing body and Mosey says, hey, was that? And Gabe says, don't even ask. Don't even say it. So could be that indeed it was the body of Christ. Gabe goes back because he wants to choose Grace and finds a note that he that she has left to go to the uh, land of the monks, the Schottenegger monks. And that is the end 
of my commentary of Gabriel Knight. Whew, that is a lot of talking and a lot of Sydney. Uh, hopefully you enjoyed the commentary. Um, I highly recommend playing Gabriel Knight 3. It is an amazing game. So we see at the end, the unicorn is free. And that, my friends, is the end. Unfortunately, there is never a Gabriel Knight 4. Hmm. All right, well, see you in the Black Cauldron soon.